to order. I'm Councilmember Weezer, the chair of the committee. We've been joined by Councilmember Harris Dawson, Councilmember Blumenfield. And um, if we um, first take up the item called the multiple item speaker cards, those are items for which people choose to speak on two items or more. We understand that people have chosen to speak on seven and eight, so we'll take those up at that time. For right now, uh, we think we believe, I believe we have four people. First one is Herman. Yes, sir. In support of opposition for the so-called Vista Del Mar and that of Mr. Bonin who step out, or here he is to my right, he must understand that overdevelopment and density is not what we permit in our community. We don't need additional problems of taking away our beautiful community. Thank you, Mr. Bonin. Return to your seat. So you see, when you go yellow, my fellows, this is how you respond. We are delegating the negative report that we condemn this project. But it's going to go forward because we know behind closed doors the discussion between Weezard, Dawson, Englander, Price have already made that determination for us. So we have nothing to say but to be what they tell us to be. Changos, pussies, because we don't speak out against the regime of this fucking development. It doesn't incorporate us. It doesn't involve us. So what do you do in your community? Sit back until it all happens and shit hits the fan and now you're here to speak out? That's right. Culver Boulevard, Trolley Place, all these fucking places done by a negative declaration because there was no mitigation for I, a public speaker, to have transparency to cope with the harassment, the intimidation by the developer who came into our community and raped us the same way woo, raped the woman at UCLA while she was on Off topic, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Fuck you, Dawson. Thank you. Uh, Molly Q, Q, there's a Molly and a CU. Okay. Is there an Irma here? Okay, no Irma either. Noel Weiss. Noel Weiss. I wanted to make a, uh, a quick public comment, general public comment first. May we're, do doing, we're doing general public comment at the end of the at meeting. At the end of the meeting? This Fine. is, you signed up to speak on three items that are on the agenda. Yeah, well, one was general public comment and the other was seven and eight. So I'll wait till seven You'll wait till seven and eight? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Okay, so um, that brings us to the consent items. On item number three, we will approve that item. With no objection. Oh, there's a speaker in item three? Okay, let's hold that item. Item four, let's approve item four on consent without objection. Item five, we will continue without objection. Item nine, we will continue. There's no objection to continuing. We'll continue that item as well. And on item three, if we could call that to order, please. Yes, uh, this is an application for the determination of public convenience or necessity uh, submitted by Audi for off-site sales of alcoholic beverages. Thank you. Item three, the public speaker is Doug Cooper. Actually, part of the applicant team, so we're here to answer any questions. 
Okay, good. That item was in consent. It, it was scheduled to pass with a so. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So on item three, we will move to approve. Any objections to that? Seeing none, so ordered. That brings us to item one, report from the Director of Planning, Vince Bertorni. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Wiesar and members of the um, Planning and Land Management Committee. Uh, just real brief, we're, we're underway in our transit neighborhood plans in, in the Valley with the Orange Line right now. We've been going through public hearings. Um, so there's just so there's multiple stations along the orange line in, in the valley that we're going through um, reaching getting out for public input and comment we're looking at ways that we could um, provide for additional housing opportunity as well as jobs along those stations mm -hmm. we're also looking at opportunities to really incorporate the the transit neighborhood plans that are in the western end of the, the southwestern end into the southwest community plan update so we're going through that process right now and we've been getting really good feedback and and We'll be bringing those back to these uh, to this committee after it goes through city uh, city planning commission. That that concludes my staff report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Thank you for your report. We will receive and file item number one. That brings us to um, item number six. If we could. Um, Uh, this is an appeal filed by uh, Kate Bartolo relative to the site plan review and conditions of approval for a proposed mixed-use development in CD14 containing 452 dwelling units. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Mace Reynolds. I'm project planner for the Cape Coast before you today. Um, as mentioned, this is for a mixed-use project located at the corner of 6th Street and Main Street. Um, it's for a 38-story mixed-use building with 452 residential condos and 21,514 square feet of ground floor commercial. On May 10, 2018, the <coughs> Planning Commission approved a request for a transfer floor floor area for a maximum of a 9.1 to 1 FAR for the site as well as site plan review. Uh, the applicant subsequently appealed the determination, specifically appealing um, condition number 7D related to the amount of EV, um, required EV charger stations for the parking. And with that, uh, planning recommends denial of the appeal and that the committee approve the requested TFAR. Um, I'm available for any questions if you have any. Okay, thank you. We will turn to public comment now. Kate Bartolo. Kate Bartolo, Kate Bartolo and Associates. I'll be very brief. We accept the proposed uh, revised language and conditions for both the EV condition, which is 7B, and also for TFAR public benefits relating to the streetcar to instead be pri provided to bringing back Broadway, Broadway Streetscape and Lonnie, the nonprofit. Um, just very briefly, the project has been supported from the beginning um, by a wide swath of community members there have been multiple hearings over four years. It has engendered zero opposition. And that this, my understanding is that the, uh, the chair of Plum, Councilman Huizar, introduced a motion today to potentially increase the amount of EV parking spaces. And we would applaud the move to uh, change the green ordinance subject to public debate and discussion because we think that our project is an example of one in which it just makes sense to know the rules of the game in advance of the project planning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, any questions or comments on this? Yes, excuse me, I'd like to approach the board. I, uh, my name is uh, not on the list. My name is Alfredo Madrid. I'm with the uh, downtown. One second, please. Sure, um, no problem. If you need to um, fill out a card, can you fill it out with the sergeant at arms, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hollyfield, Grace. He'll take your name and you can fill it out because it might not come up on time on the electronic board, but if you could just get a name and... 
Is Hollyfield Grace? Is a Hollyfield Grace here? No? Okay, sir, you're up then. Just come up and state your name for the record, please. Yes, again, thank you for uh, taking my question. My name is Alfredo Madrid. I'm with the Downtown Weekly. Um, I was assigned this project a couple days ago, so I'm still uh, brushing up on the technicalities of this uh, proposed project. Um, I understand just having arrived, the little I've gathered, you, uh, you guys have some opposition, obviously, with the uh, economical standpoints. Um, but I had a, a question, a personal question, that goes back more to the roots of uh, in the Great Depression, this city had an advanced uh, train system similar to that that New York has contemporary. So um, does this streetcar, I understand, is three to four miles long. Does it intend to uh, span in the coming generations as intricate of a uh, system as was as is still underground actually here in L.A.? So please, if you could uh, suffice to answer that in uh, few words I'd appreciate it thank you thank you an item number six that has to do with 601 South Main um, any further questions or comments seeing none I'll move to grant in part uh, the appeal of the site plan review conditions with the following amendment in regards to electric vehicle parking requirements amend condition 7d to require that all of the provided parking stalls shall comply with the current green building requirements for EV parking in addition, no less than 20% of any parking spaces which are provided in excess of the code required parking requirement, but in no case less than one location shall be capable of supporting the future installation of EVSE. I also move to amend development condition A2CI2 to clarify that the payment shall be to the Los Angeles Neighborhood Initiative for the Bringing Back Broadway Initiative, including Night on Broadway programming. To the applicant that and the appellant that satisfies your concern with the EVs, correct? Yep. Okay. So, any um, objections to the motion? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. I think we could quickly take up um, item two and then get to uh, item seven and eight. So on item two, if you could call that up. Call. Yes, uh, this is a report from the city administrative officer relative to a funding plan for the downtown Los Angeles streetcar project. Great, thank you, welcome. Thank you. Ida Rubio with the office of the city administrative officer. So um, just to provide you a brief background on the project itself, um, streetcar project was approved by council in 2012. Um, the two main city departments that are working on the project are Alley DOT. Uh, they are involved in the planning and they will be involved in the operations and maintenance. And the Bureau of Engineering is the lead on the design and construction for the project. So the report before you is requesting approval of three items. Essentially, we're asking for approval of the overall funding plan to support the construction costs for the streetcar project, either under a traditional construction manager general contractor method or an alternative project delivery method if that is more feasible. The second item is authority for DOT to submit a federal small starts grant application by the September 7th deadline. And the last item is approval for the Department of Transportation to submit a proposal to the Allen Metro Board for acceleration funding of up to $200 million under the guidelines of the Measure M ordinance. Um, we also have a technical correction to the report. Um, on page six of the report, the CEQA process is um, listed in the report as being completed in November of 2016, and the, the year should be the completion was done in November of 2017. Um, there is no general fund impact to the items um, being requested in this report. Funding would come from a variety of sources, including the proposed grant or proposed acceleration funding from Metro. Uh, do you have any additional questions? Okay. Here to answer them. Okay, great. We'll go to public comment at this time. Um, so first, uh, Shane Phillips, then Dana Gabed, Steve Needleman.
afternoon, council members. Uh, I'm Shane Phillips with Central City Association. We're here today to speak in support of the downtown streetcar and, and to encourage the city to move the project forward. Uh, downtown is set to grow by over 120,000 residents and 50,000 jobs over the next 20 years. And we won't be able to function if each of those new residents and workers has to drive every day. Combined with other transit options that are coming like bike share and more welcoming sidewalks, we need the streetcar to provide alternatives to driving and to encourage housing that's built more affordably and with less parking. The streetcar will connect residents, workers, and visitors to increasing regional transit services that can bring them to other parts of the city and county. Um, and it will also help people make first and last mile trips within downtown without adding more cars to the road. The streetcar fills a service gap that's only going to widen as downtown grows in the coming years. So we hope that you'll vote to move it forward today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a Dana here? Dana? And then Steve Niederman, Dana Gabied. Yes, I'm speaking here on behalf of both the Rail Users Network, which I'm on the Board of Directors of, Southern California Transit Advocates, which I am a treasurer for, and occasionally I'm also a contributor to Streets Blog. In fact, the reason I'm here partly is because I went to the public hearing on the environmental assessment on the streetcar, which got a very poor turnout. Evidently, no one even bothered to publicize it, whereas Mr. Weezer and his little meeting uh, machine has evidently publicized this one, so I'm here to see what sort of response you get about it. Um, I've never really taken a strong position for or against this thing. I'm concerned about $300 million or so for a very lackluster ridership. Um, the question is this. We're, uh, most of these streetcars around the country are de justified on the basis of drawing development. I beg you to go out on the streets of downtown and point somewhere that is in desperate need of help with development. So are we building this for a purpose where history has long passed it and basically now we're chasing something that's already solved? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Steve Needleman, Shiraz Tangri, Nick Griffin. My name is Steve Needleman. I'm a property owner on Broadway, and I am also chairman of Los Angeles Streetcar Inc., the nonprofit organization that was started back in 2009 to help along with CD14 to bring a streetcar to Los Angeles. I. This is a project that has been supported by the property owners and more specifically that it's supported in a way of financially. We've put in over $85 million that's been committed through our community facilities district and shows the involvement and the participation of what property owners are willing to commit to in the area. We urge you to support this. We are shovel ready and ready to proceed ahead. And we urge you again to support this project and so that we can continue with the other aspects of funding that are needed to complete this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Shiraz Tangri. I'm here as general counsel of LA Streetcar Inc. Um, I wanna commend the committee and the departments for moving the project to this point. This is a very important milestone. As the council member is well aware, this project is, has been in development now for close to a decade in its current form. Um, it's benefited tremendously from the Bringing Back Broadway uh, effort, um, but it, I think it now stands on its own as a project that will serve the downtown that's emerged over the last decade. Um, in that decade, the population of residents downtown has doubled. We know that number is gonna continue to increase. We see growth in downtown continuing through a, a tremendous economic cycle. Um, and in all that time period, with all of the private and public investment downtown, this is the first new transit system proposed to circulate folks around downtown, dedicated to getting people around different neighborhoods in downtown. And that continues to be very valid and very important, frankly, increasingly important, because it's gonna be more and more important to get cars off the road as our population, our daytime and evening continues to increase. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Griffin, Hillary Norton, Wallace Locke. Uh, my name is Nick Griffin, and I am here on behalf of the downtown center bid, uh, through much of which the streetcar will run. Um, I'll be brief. I 
came over on the metro bike, and that was a lot easier than walking. Um, but I look forward to taking the, uh, the streetcar because that'll be even easier. I think that uh, you know downtown is booming on the residential uh, office and retail front, and uh, this kind of mobility uh, improvement would greatly enhance that, as well as uh, offering opportunities for economic development and marketing, particularly for the for the core along Broadway. And so we're strongly supportive of it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. As the executive director of FAST, Fixing Angelinos Stuck in Traffic, and of the new FastLink DTLA Transportation Management Organization, I am here to testify in support of accelerating funding for the downtown LA streetcar. Over the next 22 years, downtown LA will have 20% of the growth of the entire city. We see this as an important tool in reducing traffic, improving mobility options, and providing an accessible transit option for those using wheelchairs, strollers, and requiring easier assistance boarding a vehicle. In cities like Seattle and Portland, streetcars haven't just been a catalyst for development. They're a catalyst to move away from use of single occupant vehicles. They've been a catalyst for tourism, and they are especially a catalyst for families with young children who want to move around differently and travel together. I thank you all for your vision in putting this together, and it's time to move this project forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wallace Locke here on behalf of the South Park Business Improvement District. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. The support for this project has been demonstrated by downtown property owners, residents, and business owners at community meetings, by the adoption of the special tax district, and through the contribution of millions of dollars of TFAR and other funds. The streetcar will connect diverse neighborhoods of downtown, providing a, another transit option for visitors, residents, and workers. The project is shovel ready, allowing a quick construction schedule to minimize the disruptions to our rapidly growing neighborhood in South Park. And the funding plan doesn't use any money from the general fund. The project will support billions of dollars of public and private investment in downtown. It follows street enhancements in South Park and throughout downtown, like My Figueroa. And as downtown continues to grow, the population in South Park is expected to triple in the next two years. Uh, it's crucial that transit options grow with that community. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Well, let me first thank uh, the CAO for coming forward with this report, and secondly, to the public speakers who have come out in support of the project. And as many of you know, we've been working on this project for quite some time. Uh, there's quite a bit of support for it uh, in downtown and throughout the region, uh, and for various reasons. Uh, first and foremost, it is a great transportation system, and was, as was mentioned, downtown is slated for uh, enormous growth. Uh, Ten years ago, we had about 10,000 people who lived in downtown. Today, we have about 65 to 75,000 people. And it's estimated that by the year 2040, we will have an additional 140,000 people on top of that to, uh, uh, that will live in downtown. That's not to mention the enormous growth we're seeing with people visiting downtown. With LA Live and a number of other uh, entertainment venues opening up, we see a lot more uh, people visiting downtown, new museums. Also, uh, we have a lot more bars and restaurants who have opened up for people who to come and visit. Uh, with that, there's going to be a need for a first and last mile transportation option. Uh, as we build a regional connector that's essentially a underground subway that goes in a circle in downtown, people are going to get off that and want to have that first and last mile transportation option. So it's a great transportation option. But secondly, other cities have shown us, like Portland and Seattle, that it is also a great economic development driver. Now, a comment was made in public comment that we see all this economic activity in downtown Los Angeles. Well, the fact of the matter is that the street Broadway, which is the backbone uh, where the streetcar will go through from 1st all the way down to about 11th Street, that still needs some economic stimulus and incentives to move forward. But we've seen what the announcement of a streetcar has done. For example, Apple has announced that it will move to the Tower Theater. Uh, we see the Ace Hotel United Artists that have decided to refurbish that theater and open up a hotel there because they anticipate the streetcar coming. So the mere announcement of a streetcar coming has already stimulated some of that growth that we otherwise wouldn't have seen. In fact, the reason we started bringing back Broadway 10 years ago is because we saw development occurring throughout downtown, but not in that beautiful historic street. 
and the streetcar is helping move uh, some of that growth forward. And last but not least, one of the great attributes of the streetcar is that it's uh, nostalgic uh, for many people who have lived in LA for a very long time. Uh, they've either ridden it or they know someone's ridden it. And uh, as we think about more destination points and preserving our history of Los Angeles, this adds to that as well in terms of what it can provide for the historical perspective. What we have before us today is a financial plan that will hope, help hopefully get us to the finish line. Uh, the environmental impact report is completed. We are in about 30% engineering. Uh, the money is all on the table. We have about 60 to $70 million from a local assessment where over 73% of the voters in that area decided to assess themselves for the construction of the streetcar. And we have about $200 million in Measure M dollars at Metro. Unfortunately, we can only access the Measure M dollars in the year 2053. This financial plan allows us to hopefully access those dollars sooner to get Metro and the board to approve an accelerated financial plan that would allow us to draw upon those dollars, uh, as well as possibly go with a public-private partnership, and, to, and it authorizes our city agencies to apply for some federal funding that may be available for streetcars. So um, this is simply authorizing a, uh, a plan to move forward to authorize the departments to start talking with Metro and with the federal government to access some of these dollars. And given that it's been in the works for a very long time, we've been excited about this before where, as a public comment uh, speaker said, that at the last environmental meeting for the federal environmental review, there wasn't a large turnout. but. We have had hundreds, if not thousands, of people turn out for other meetings where there's a lot of excitement for this, and hopefully with this financial plan, this is um, putting the final touches on us to move forward with this very important project. So I would ask for your I vote on this. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so we'll move to approve this item. That's all we need is an approval, correct, on the report, or are there any specific directions? Uh, the report also recommends approval of the funding plan to support the construction costs under construction manager, authorize the submission of a Federal Transit Administration small start grant application, and to instruct the DOT to submit a proposal to Metro to accelerate the uh, Measure M funding that was programmed in 2053. Okay. Well, we had the one small technical correction to the report. Um, the CEQA report. On page six of the report, the CEQA review process was completed in November 2017 instead of November 2016. Thank you. Okay, and let me read what I had as a motion to see if it coincides with the items uh, the CLA's office read and the CAO's office. It is to approve the technical corrections as described by the CAO in their presentation. Uh, modify instruction number three to say as follows. <coughs> Instruct the DOT to submit a proposal to the Los Angeles Metropolitan Transportation Authority Board within 60 days for funding of up to $200 million for the downtown LA streetcar project. And the additional items will incorporate, as mentioned by the CLA earlier. Correct? Uh, correct. That's everything. Okay. All right. With that, we'll move that item forward with no objection. Thank you very much. Next items are items 7 and 8. Um, Council Member Bonnie, you, uh, you prefer to speak before the presentation or after the presentation? Then you, okay, thank you. Is the uh, presentation ready on this item? Go right ahead. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Juliet O, city planner with the Department of City Planning. Items number seven and eight before you are an appeal of the approval of the tentative track map number 70786-REV and a coastal development permit under case number DIR 
2012-3537 for a project that consists of the construction of a four-story, 48 feet in height, 79,493 square foot mixed use development comprised of ground floor commercial use as well as 72 dwelling units of which eight are restricted as very low income. The construction of one subterranean parking level providing a total of 123 parking spaces as well as excavation and grading necessary for the project. The project includes a reversion to acreage to merge portions of the right of way, uh, portions of Culver Boulevard as well as Trolley Place as well as the merger of the existing lots to form one lot and the vacation of the Vista Del Mar Lane Alley which runs through the site. The tentative track map and coastal development permit were approved by the advisory agency and director of planning on March 16th, 2018 and appealed to the city planning commission. At its meeting on June 28th, 2018, the CPC denied the appeals of the tentative track map. The CPC failed to act on the appeals of the director's determination, thereby reverting to the initial approval of the director of planning. The appeal points and issues raised by the appellants are the same as those submitted during the first level appeal to the City Planning Commission. Staff's response to the specific points are addressed in the staff recommendation reports to the CPC. Staff recommends denial of the appeals of the tentative tract as well as the coastal development permit. I'm available if you have any, any questions. Okay, great, thank you. So this has gone through both um, uh, the, the area or the Citywide Planning Commission? The City Planning Commission. Citywide Planning Commission and the Coastal Commission. It hasn't gone to the Coastal Commission. It hasn't commission gone yet. to the Coastal Commission yet. Okay, I wanted to get that clear. Okay, thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes. Councilmember Bonin? Uh, thank you, colleagues, and good afternoon. Uh, appreciate you giving me some time to come and speak on this item today. Uh, this is, in the five years I've been in office, probably only the fourth time I've come to speak at Plum. Uh, but I wanted to come here personally today to make a direct and emphatic appeal to, appeal to you to grant this appeal and to deny this project. Uh, and in doing so, I stand with uh, the great majority of the people in Playa del Rey, uh, with renters and with homeowners, with coastal advocates, uh, with the Neighborhood Council of Playa del Rey, and with the LAX Coastal Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, those are folks uh, that generally do not always come together with the same position on an issue, and they have on this one. Uh, as I said, I don't come to, to Plum very often, and I think the last time I was here I was asking you to approve a project. It was the Caruso Project in downtown Pacific Palisades. Uh, a case where a developer went out and uh, talked to the community a great deal, sat in their living rooms and listened, and shaped a project that had enormous public support. And uh, I came before you then and I asked you to adhere to the will of the community and approve a project that was actually seeking less than Mr. Caruso could have sought. This project is very different. The project is very different process is very different, the public perception is very different, and my recommendation is very different. Uh, and I'm asking for the, the granting of the appeal and the denial of the project really for, for, for three reasons. Uh, the, the adherence or lack of with the Coastal Act and the community plan. Uh, number two uh, uh, would be um, uh, some groundwater issues and the potential threat to public health and safety. Uh, and uh, the third is uh, the, the request that I do not approve of, of giving parts of the public right away uh, to, to shape this development and make it bigger. Uh, first of all, when it comes to adherence with the plans, it's important to know because uh, most of you, well none of you actually have uh, any, any communities in the coastal zone, that uh, there are different levels of review and jurisdiction and compliance with planning uh, that we need to make and we need to find. Uh, this area is in the coastal zone, so this means that we need to be looking at the conditions of the Coastal Act. We need to be looking at the Westchester uh, Playa del Rey Community Plan, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the most recently approved community plan in my district. Uh, and we also need to be looking at the Del Rey Lagoon specific plan. Now, a little bit later, uh, the project applicants are going to come up and tell you you shouldn't be looking at the Del Rey Lagoon specific plan, that the city never gave it final approval. Let me tell you otherwise. For, for those of you who are not fluent in coastal stuff, the way the Delray Lagoon specific plan and plans in the coastal zone work is it's an iterative process. It's a negotiation between the community and the Coastal Commission. 
The city approved a Delray Lagoon specific plan. The Coastal Commission reviewed it and made some changes. The city did not officially ratify those additional tweaks by the Coastal Commission, but very significantly, the city enshrined the provisions of the Delray Lagoon specific plan in the community plan update and in the approved community plan for the area. Uh, the, the community plan for Westchester and Playa del Rey specifically calls out the Delray Lagoon specific plan as the standard by which projects in this area should be measured. And that means a condition of 37 feet, and that means adherence to design standards of, of compatibil compatibility with the neighborhood. Um, and uh, since that time, since the approval of the community plan, the city and the Coastal Commission, both the city and the Coastal Commission, uh, have used uh, adherence with the Delray Goon specific plan as the standard by which discretionary projects in this area should be measured. That applies not just for the, the uh, project itself, but uh, for the reversion of acreage and, and the use of uh, the alley and the vacation. The California Coastal Act in section 30151 of the Public Resources Code states, and I'll quote, that the scenic and visual qualities of coastal areas shall be considered and protected as a resource of public importance. Permitted development shall be cited and designed to be visually compatible with the surrounding areas. This project is not. And this project's lack of compatibility, if approved by this city, uh, in contradiction of the Delray Lagoon specific plan, in contradiction of the community plan, and in contradiction of our obligation. Mr. Uh, Bonin, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, Herman, uh, you know the rules in this, uh, in these meetings, uh, you come to them every day. Uh, do not wave your hands in the air and distract the public and uh, the, the speaker from speaking. This is your first warning. If you were to disrupt this meeting again, we're gonna have to ask you to leave. And Thank you very much, but uh, you're, you're going to have to leave right now, sir. Your vulgar uh, middle finger sticking out and your obscenities. And, and thank you very much. We're, ask, uh, we're asking you to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Herman continues to shout obscenities and racial epithets as he's escorted out by a Los Angeles Police Department officer. This is at least the 10th meeting in a row where we have this problem from the same exact individual. At least. <laughs> at least. I think he's batting a thousand. Yeah. Sorry to disrupt you, Mr. Bonin. Um, if you could continue, please. That, that's yeah. quite all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. L let me please just interrupt my own comments to uh, explain and to apologize to the large number of constituents from Playa del Rey who are here who are unfamiliar with the phenomenon that we have to live with in every single public meeting in this building. Uh, as a result of our compliance with the, the Brown Act and adherence to the First Amendment, we are obligated to put up with that sort of offensive language uh, on a regular basis, and I apologize that, that you had to hear it. Um, before we were interrupted uh, characteristically by Mr. Herman, I was saying that if, if the city were to approve this project uh, in, in violation of our, our obligations to look out for the provisions of the Coastal Act and in defiance of the conditions of the Delray Lagoon specific plan and the Westchester Playa Del Rey uh, community plan, uh, we would be setting a tremendous precedent in that community where every project would then want to come in with the higher height and it would fundamentally alter the fabric of the community. It would prejudice the community plan update that we are about to launch or that planning has just launched in this area and it would prejudice the local coastal plan which we are obligated to, to do here in the city of Los Angeles as part of our adherence uh, uh, to the Coastal Act. It would also have the impact of sparking a gentrification of this community. Folks uh, living in, in rent control buildings, some 300 long-term tenants of rent control buildings, we, we know as sure as the day is long that if this precedent is set and the caps are busted on this, uh, that those buildings are gonna get Ellis and we're gonna see people tossed out onto the street. 
Uh, on the groundwater issues, I'll defer largely to, to the appellant, who will talk about it uh, in, in uh, great detail, but uh, the, the analysis of the groundwater issues here is uh, both inadequate and improperly studied. Uh, it looks at the impacts of the construction, but not the operation. I don't believe it looks at the right groundwater table. Uh, and again, uh, Kathy Schwartzfeger will detail that, that more, but it raises grave health and safety concerns for me, and it, it should for the city. And then let me address the issues of the public right-of-way. Um, this project uh, is asking for several pieces of what I and the neighborhood consider to be uh, public land. It is asking for four things. A 10-foot wide strip of land along Culver Boulevard, a variable width strip of land along Trolley Place in excess of the 20 feet wide alley right-of-way. That was the second. The third, is a 20-foot wide and variable width public right-of-way on Vista Del Mar Lane, and four, the five-foot wide strip of land along Vista Del Mar. That is a lot for the city to be giving for a project, particularly for a project that the community does not approve. Those existing rights-of-way serve an important public pur purpose. They provide travel lanes uh, necessary for traffic to and from uh, different communities. Uh, and the rights of way could also serve as future public purpose by providing space for additional bicycle lanes, beach parking, and or neighborhood parklets. Uh, and uh, those are all things, I might point out, that are far more in line with the Coastal Act and providing coastal access than this luxury housing project would be. Um, let me also just make a, a few notes on, on process before I conclude. Uh, you know, there, there are times when the planning process works well in the city of Los Angeles, and there are times when it works in a way that the community says, this is just fundamentally broken, and it undermines faith in the process, and it undermines faith in us. The idea here, the expectation that an ask of the alleyway, an ask of 10 feet of right-of-way is our obligation to grant is fundamentally wrong. Uh, we now have a situation where, where, the, where the community or the council office simply saying we do not think that it is wise to give away this public land to add to the value of this property is, is, is met with indignation that we would even consider saying no. Uh, and that is not how the system should work. The, the, the developer's interest in this land does not trump the potential public benefit and the public use, particularly in the coastal zone. I also need to make a note about affordability uh, because uh, you will hear claims that this is an insidious attempt by uh, me and by members of the community to oppose affordable housing. In, uh, in my years in office, I have been called a lot of things by a lot of people on Twitter. Uh, this is the first time I have been called a NIMBY who opposes affordable housing by a land use lawyer. Uh, I think you know my record in standing up for housing, for affordable housing, and for homelessness. Uh, and I want to point out that this project is not about affordable housing. This is one of those projects that we see more and more now that goes in and tries to maximize its profit by adding on, like a Christmas ornament, a few units of affordable housing. This project is about luxury housing. Make no mistake about it. The affordable units have been added into this project so that the other units can go higher, get a better view, be bigger, and be more expensive. This is a luxury housing project. Do not buy that this is an affordable housing project. <coughs> saying that this is an affordable housing project is like a restaurant saying that the T-bone steak on its menu is vegetarian because there's, there's a side of broccoli that comes with it. That is exactly what this is. Uh, so um, I would uh, also note that you know I hear a lot of people in my district, as do you in your districts, objecting to affordable housing. I have not once, not once in this case, heard anybody, anybody, raise an objection about the affordable housing component. They've raised it about the other three issues that I've mentioned, but not once about the affordable housing. Not once. Uh, and what, what folks are objecting to is not affordable housing. What they are objecting to is luxury housing. Luxury housing that is made larger and more expensive 
by uh, ignoring our community plans and the Coastal Act, uh, and by granting exclusive use of the public right of way and ignoring public health and safety concerns. As I said, this sets a precedent. Uh, this would spark gentrification, uh, and we would actually wind up losing uh, affordable housing in this community as a result of that. Uh, so I want to thank you. Uh, for your time. I want to thank the community for its interest in this issue, everybody coming together. Uh, and I just want to reiterate in the strongest terms possible that I think it is our obligation to the community, it's our obligation under the Coastal Act and a number of community plans, uh, and it's our obligation to actually preserve affordable housing to grant this appeal and to deny this project, and I would ask you to do so. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now go to a continued public comment. We start off with the appellants. We have two items. Um, Yelena Zeltzer appealed both items, and uh, Catherine Schwertfrigger appealed both. And then Julie Ross, Michelle Kim, Kent Genslinger appealed item eight. So for Yelena and Catherine, you each have uh, 10 minutes, and uh, the others have five minutes. And then the appellant, uh, the applicant can come up, and they will have 10 minutes. So beginning with Yelena. And all other speakers have, uh, if you signed up to speak on both items, you have two minutes. If you signed up to speak on one item, uh, you have one minute. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Yelena Zeltzer. I'm a research analyst with Unite Here Local 11. Local 11 represents over 30,000 workers employed in hotels, restaurants, airports, sports arenas, and convention centers throughout um, Southern California and Arizona. Members of Local 11 joined together to fight for improved living standards and working conditions. Many of our members live, work, and pursue the public coastal amenities in Playa del Rey. We believe that um, the project before you fails to properly assess the project environmental impacts and presents serious conflicts with the corresponding community and specific plans, as well as with the coastal, uh, California Coastal Act. The large uh, size and scale of the project are wildly out of character with the local community, as well as with the Westchester Playa Del Rey Community Plan and the Del Rey Lagoon Specific Plan. The Del, Rey specific, the Del Rey Lagoon specific plan establishes a maximum height of 37 feet for residential and commercial development in the area and has been used as a consistent standard for development for many decades. In the NOD, um, the CPC claims that because the specific plan was prepared as a local coastal program and approved in concept by council but never adopted by the Coastal Commission, it's not an ordinance but merely a policy document and does not apply. Um, and the standard does not apply. However, the Coastal Commission has um, consistently used the 37-foot threshold for local development for over 30 years, and the community reflects this scale. Furthermore, approval of the project will undermine the city's ability to create a local coastal pr uh, plan in the future that complies with the Coastal Act. The city is long overdue for the, de uh, for the development of a local coastal program, and any future projects should be developed with the current community in mind. In addition, the project presents um, significant inconsistencies with the Westchester Playa del Rey Community Plan um, as it pertains to ensuring public use of coastal resources. The developer is seeking to revert what is currently a public street, Vista del Mar Lane, and incorporate it into acreage for the project. Vista del Mar is a street and can legally be used for public parking. Parking is a preferred use in the coastal zone and provides um, and providing adequate adequate parking so as to avoid an overflow of public parking in the residential area of the coastal zone is a stated goal of the Westchester um, Del Rey community plan. By reverting the street into project acreage, the city is abandoning its current public access use in favor of the developer and against the stated goals of the community plan and the Coastal Act. Furthermore, the project is at odds with um, several provisions of the Coastal Act itself. The project lacks sufficient parking under the precedent adopted by the Coastal Commission and the South Coast Regional Interpretive Guidelines and may result in the overflow parking being pushed out into the residential community. 
the project also fails to adhere to the visual and scenic elements of the Coastal Act. The large scale of the project block existing public views um, designated by the Westchester Community Plan. And the Delray specific plan, the scenic highway plan, um, and designation for the Mar Vis for Vista Del Mar and the Coastal Bluff specific plans. Additionally, the MND conducted for the project is inadequate. It does not adequately address the impacts on soils, methane, dewatering, and visual impacts of this project. The proposed project is located within the coastal liquefaction zone, and um, as well as in a meth uh, methane zone. The, um, the impacts and the impacts of excavation and construction need to be further studied and adequate mitigation measures put in place. Furthermore, the cumulative impacts of the development have not been adequately studied as the project is considered in isolation from the surrounding development. In conclusion, we feel that the project presents specific poten uh, the project uh, presents significant potential environmental impacts, thus requiring the preparation of a full EIR. And the project has serious inconsistencies with the Westchester Playa del Rey Community Plan, as well as with the Coastal Act, and the long-standing precedent created by the application of the Del Rey Lagoon specific plan and the um, South Coast Regional Interpretive Guidelines um, that limit the size of the development. We request that the City Council and the committee overturn the CPC's decision and reject the project. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Catherine Schwartfrager. with what's already been said, so I'll try to say stuff that's different. Um, I'd like to talk about the standard of review because I know that the applicant will. When you sit as a legislative body reviewing a discretionary project, you sit de novo. That's based on a long line of California cases, and it's very important because it allows you to make the findings you believe are the correct findings in this case. The Municipal Code and the Subdivision Map Act, when it comes to tentative track decisions, is even more clear. It asks you to hear the evidence, and it asks you to make findings. It does not ask you to find error. And under CEQA, you as the elected officials are the only body which can make a final decision regarding the adequacy of the MND. I say this as a preface because I know that you're going to be asked to rely on the decisions below. Let's be clear what the decisions below were. You do have a City Planning Commission decision in front of you regarding the track map and the MND. But as to the Coastal Development Permit and all other aspects of this case, you are relying on a director's determination. That director's determination is highly irregular. It was issued in violation of the city's own policies as to who should have been involved in the decision. It was issued in violation of the charter as to who should have been involved in the decision. And the very hearings we went to where the Coastal Development Permit was heard the individual who heard those hearings was still on the city's payroll, but did not participate in the decision. So I su suggest that as to the director's decision, you look at it exactly in light of all that context and facts and weigh it for what it's worth. As to the tract map, in order to approve the tract map, you need to find that Legato owns all of the property which the tract map covers. Legato does not own the 10 feet of Culver Boulevard, which is, it is seeking to have vacated. A professional land surveyor has gone back through the historical records and looked at the deeds that applicant has submitted into the record and has formed the conclusion that the 10 feet do not belong to Legato. That was submitted into the record today. I got it as I was walking in here, essentially. But at the end of the day, the way the tracks were declared, and I've been arguing this for over four years, is that track 8820, the tract across the street, was staked to include Culver Boulevard, and the owners of lots in that portion of the subdivision, in fact, own the street. You cannot approve the track map because it covers property which Legato does not own, and the only competence 
evidence in the record on this issue is that which I have submitted. An ALTA survey, is, which is what they have submitted, covers boundaries as they are presented by a title company or deeds. It does not cover whether or not those boundaries are accurate based on the deeds. So I'd like to move to the uses of the track map property. Mike covered them, but again, I'd like to note that in Lower Playa del Rey, the convention of parking on alleys is very widespread. In the records you'll find, we actually operate a tandem area on an extension of the very same alley you're being asked to vacate. So there would be nothing unusual in your finding that in Lower Playa del Rey, the law does allow and nobody gets a parking ticket for parking on an alley. I'd like to talk about the Coastal Act and character and scale. The Coastal Act um, requires adherence to character and scale, and people have touched on that, but I'd like to talk a little bit about one particular decision, which is literally one street and one lot away from applicant's property at 112 Colvin. In that decision, the Coastal Commission was asked to approve a single elevator tower going to 41 feet, and it held that elevator tower would violate the Coastal Act and that the required height to comply with 30251 of the Coastal Act was 37 feet. I'd also like to talk about the character and scale study. We as a community have done a character and scale study which is in the record, which involves building permits with actual heights written on them. Applicant is going to stand up and tell you where he's found four-story buildings. In Playa del Rey, there are a number of reasons why you would find what looks to be a four-story building, but which is really not. And the first reason is the design of buildings under the Del Rey Lagoon specific plan. Um, the buildings were supposed to be built with loges, which doesn't count as a story, and they also are allowed to have an underground parking structure, which doesn't count as a story, it's a basement. And when you take a picture of a building like that from a lagoon, it looks like it's four stories tall. But if you go to the building permits and you go to the actual heights, you're going to find that overwhelmingly Playa del Rey is under three stories. And um, when you look at Canal Gardens or any of the Coastal Commission's decisions, you're supposed to make your decision based on a norm, not albatrosses. I would also like to talk about visual impact. The city of Los Angeles has specifically looked at the bluffs in the lower Playa del Rey area in a number of its planning documents. And the Coastal Act says that views that are declared by public ordinances are protected under the Coastal Act. You have looked at these views in the Westchester Playa del Rey Community Plan, the Scenic Highway Plan, which declares Vista Del Mar a scenic highway. You've looked at these views in the Coastal Bluff Ordinance. You looked at these views in the precursor to the Coastal Bluff Ordinance, where you actually provided a map which showed which views you were intending to protect. And I have provided in the record an arrow that goes directly to the corner of Montreal Street and Vista Del Mar, which is a public view over a public retaining wall owned by the city of Los Angeles. Jim Dewey has provided models, which you've received um, copies of, which demonstrate this building will specifically obliterate the views from that location, which is a historic scenic overlook for the community, and it will also obliterate views of the bluffs from the uh, beach and the bike path. I'd like to talk about parking because our parking speaker may not get here. Parking is a Coastal Act priority because coastal access is a priority. We've done a survey of beachgoers. I provided you with umbrella pictures. We are a public beach, but we can only remain a public beach if there's adequate parking. The Coastal Act embodies parking standards. In the case of Playa del Rey, they are found in the Del Rey Lagoon Plan and in the Regional Interpretive Guidelines. And in my letter, I provided you examples of those standards being used. What those standards would show for this building is that it needs 212 parking spaces to be parked to coastal standard. It currently has 123. And what that means is the overflow parkers are going to be taking the parking that would otherwise be available for the beach going public. The 
Beach is a public resource, and the Coastal Commission has consistently said, therefore, adequacy of parking in new development is a Coastal Act issue. By the standards you have, which are the Regional Interpretive Guidelines and the Delray Lagoon Plan, this building is radically underparked. And finally, a word about affordable housing in the coastal zone. Many, many other communities have adopted local coastal plans that integrate incentives for affordable housing into the local coastal plan while respecting the Coastal Act and the Coastal Act Chapter 3 priorities. Sometimes this means a very nuanced approach. There's some locations where you can put a taller building and not run into the Coastal Act and have a problem. There are other locations where you just simply can't. This is one of those locations where you simply can't. But if and when we get to doing a local coastal plan for Lower Playa del Rey, certainly affordable housing incentives should be considered. And finally, on the Housing and Accountability Act. The final word on that as you go through the tangle of the statutes is that if you find it's not feasible to accommodate this building, then the building can be denied based on the Coastal Act under the Housing and Accountability Act. Um, I thank you for your time. I got way more of it than I expected, and so I spoke with no notes. I hope I didn't repeat anything, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Julie Ross. Thank you, council members. I'd also like to thank Council Member Mike Bonin and his staff for all the work they've done in working with the community on this project. I'm Julie Ross, a lifelong resident of Playa del Rey, a founding board member and vice president of the Playa del Rey Guardian Society. We're a 501c3 which uh, works to live up to its name. I'm a board member of the Westchester Playa Neighborhood Council and I'm not speaking on behalf of the council today. I want to talk first about the toxic plume. There's a known PCE toxic plume underneath the old dry cleaners, which is 500 feet from the project site. The water board's known about this since 2002. They've been able to, unable to find a responsible party. They're very concerned with the real possibility of vapor intrusion and its threat to the health and safety of the public. In 2015, the water board applied for funding in the amount of $1.5 million to analyze and delineate the plume. In March 2018, they received funding in the amount of $650,000. The appellant's going to claim the Water Board has received the funding to clean the site. This is not true. They've received approximately 40% of the funds requested to test and analyze the plume. The Water Board cannot know at this time the cost of the cleanup and remediation of a highly concentrated PCE toxic plume on a site where a dry cleaner is operated for over 40 years. The funding is a starting point for the required testing and anal analyzation. I'm sure this committee can understand that. The applicant plans to build a one-level subterranean parking garage in their, in, their gra in their own 2012 MND. They acknowledge the pumping activities required for construction dewatering could pull the documented groundwater impacts at the Delray cleaners towards the project site and recommended further study. None has been required or performed. The applicant claims they won't hit groundwater excavating their garage, so there's no issue with the plume. That's not so. Groundwater's at three to five feet. The applicant's own 2015 Citadel report shows they will hit groundwater. The report makes hypothetical recommendations and concludes that more data is needed before any mitigation can be designed. The city and applicant have yet to meet that burden. Another applicant's report says the uh, water gradient is moving northeast. When, when, you, when, you start decon when you start excavating to suck water out of the ground to build your underground parking, you start moving water around. The gradient of the water will begin to move. In this case, our hydrologist has determined that the gradient of the water, and there's determined that that as well could move 800 feet in any direction, which puts it in the Biona wetlands, the protected Biona wetlands. Um, Downtown Playa del Rey drug, drug through our town, under businesses, under residents, under restaurants, and potentially out to the Pacific Ocean. So the, and the Water Board does not have the jurisdiction over what happens to the water between the applicant's project site 540 feet away and the dry cleaners that's contaminated. 
the um, authority and jurisdiction of that is the lead agency. In this case, it's the city of Los Angeles. And as a lead agency, you have the authority and legal and moral obligation to protect your citizens from the public health and safety hazards the plume poses. City should be required, the city should require that no dewatering be done until the plume's been analyzed and delineated and a remediation plan is put into place and it's been determined that it is safe to dewater. There remains no enforceable mitigation incorporated into the project for preventing the plume movement. The Regional Water Board only has the authority to deal with the plume if it moves. But the goal under CEQA is to prevent that from happening in the first place. The city and applicant have not yet met that burden. A little about cumulative impact. Our commercial districts has a lot of large older inventory that could be recycled. If this project's allowed to go to 47 feet, that's going to be very precedent setting. Developers, many of them in this room, are waiting in the wings, and if one goes, they're all going to go. Uh, there's an entire block across the street that's owned by the Entrican family. In 2014, they submitted a letter to planning saying that they're in favor of this project as long as in the future, if we decide to build our block to 56 feet, we want it to be on the record that we will be granted the same height as you will be allowing for this project. That is cumulative impact. There are many other examples of this, including the applicant's own property. If one goes, they all go. Uh, the commercial district, the cumulative impact would be visual, traffic, parking, dewatering, and more. I'm running out of time. I was going to say something about the, the Coastal Act, but I think you've heard a lot about that. You might feel like you're at a Coastal Commission hearing today. So I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Kim. Is Michelle Kim here? No? Kent, Kenslinger, Kent, I'm his designated speaker, is that allowed or, or no? If you stand up and say on record that you're his representative, we will take that at face value. Yes. Thank you, Kent. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Yes, I'm, I'm, for this purpose, his designated representative. Um, the, uh, I think uh, uh, Ms. Schwarzenegger dealt with the issue of parking, so I don't uh, want to repeat that, but I think uh, where we're at right now, uh, Council, is a, uh, we're kind of at the intersection between uh, the Coastal Act and the Density Bonus Law. And while technically the Density Bonus Law issues are not before you, the Coastal Commission provisions and the Coastal Commission Act are before you. There's a, and, and what has not been stated uh, is that there is a, the uh, Coastal Commission guidelines s require a max of 37 feet. Those Coastal Commission guidelines, uh, this council, this city, has to respect. Uh, they're not being respected in the project uh, as uh, presented by the applicant, and uh, I believe that the uh, Coastal Commission provisions override by law the SB 1818 provisions, the density bonus provisions in any event. Uh, so respecting uh, that 37-foot height limitation, I think, uh, should be forthcoming by this committee and this council. Secondly, uh, with regard to the respect of the visual and scenic aspects that are protected, the vo those values protected by the Coastal Act, I think it's fair uh, to try to reconcile to the extent that we're talking about providing affordable housing uh, to uh, use the analysis of if and to what extent they really need the added height in order to provide the eight affordable units. They haven't demonstrated that they, can, that they need that additional height. And I think the councilman whose appearance here today is to be uh, praised and respected made it clear to you, uh, gentlemen, that um, this is really about luxury housing and that, in effect, we're talking about profit speculation. The, 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 the applicant overpaid for the property to begin with. He wants the public to subsidize uh, rights of way. Uh, on top of everything else, and by the way, there is no credit in his analysis anywhere for this, what amounts to all of this public land giveaway. Uh, I think if we're going to evaluate, at a minimum, uh, the need to go th another 10 feet higher than what the uh, Coastal Act regulations and guidelines provide, at a minimum, uh, you need to put into that calculation the value of the, of the, of the public giveaway, which uh, Councilman Bonin uh, has indicated to you, gentlemen, that uh, should not be done. Uh, so, on that ground alone, 
although not technically a complete density bonus analysis, I think uh, it's certainly appropriate and plausible to use the same analysis in the context of what, if and whether or not any so-called concessions or incentives uh, are needed in order to provide the affordable housing. They can provide these eight units within the uh, footprint of, the, uh, uh, of a 37-foot high building. Um, there, there's, there's no question about that uh, in terms of the record before you. Third, uh, I think if there's any project that uh, requires an EIR, I think this is it. With all these complications uh, that, that are before you, uh, the fact that this was done on MND is really kind of shocking. Uh, and I think the, the, the courts are being a little bit more scrupulous and uh, uh, thoughtful about uh, basically just ramming these things through without a thoughtful economic analysis. And again, here you've got a lot of uh, currents and cross currents relative to the local community plans and, uh, and, and again, the Coastal Act. So um, I think there's clearly enough evidence on the record to support and justify the, uh, uh, the uh, preparation and analysis of, of a formal EIR, a complete EIR, which was, again, for the record, not done in this project. So uh, going forward, um, I would again follow on what the councilman said and uh, ask this uh, committee uh, and, and the city council as a whole, this committee to recommend to the city council that the appeals be granted uh, and that the uh, uh, applicant basically sent back uh, for a competent redo in, in connection with uh, what's appropriate under the Coastal Act and the, uh, Calif and, and the CEQA laws. Thank you. Okay, now for the uh, applicant, um, Benjamin Resnick is the representative of record. Sir, and you have uh, 10 minutes. Uh, hi, Benjamin Resnick with Jeffrey Mangles Butler and Mitchell. Um, there was about half an hour of testimony here on multiple appeals. I have to respond to all the appeals, and I would ask for equal time. Sure. Uh, I don't I could think give I need, more than I don't think I need yeah. 30 minutes because yeah. th you, they spoke for over 30, about 45 minutes. Yeah. But I can't do it in 10 minutes because of sure. all we'll, the speakers. We'll be, we'll be flexible with your time. Yeah, okay. so I will certainly try to get through yeah. the issues. Thank you. Members of uh, the committee, uh, my name is Ben Resnick with Jeffrey Mangles Butler and Mitchell. I've been on this project for several years. And um, let me just lay a foundation first so we clear some of the facts uh, before I get to maybe some of the other issues. Um, first and foremost, this is a commercially zoned lot. It's vacant. It's been vacant for decades. It's surrounded by public streets. <clears throat> no neighbors adjoin it. This is not one of those cases you've heard before where a density bonus project looms over a neighbor's backyard. There's no one around it. The project does not block anyone's views. In the record, we submitted a surveyor's study from the homes above us on the bluffs above us, showing that they still have the ocean views over our project. No one's views are, uh, even though those views, the private views, are not protected by law, we did the study anyways. Site is vacant. When you're at ground level, on any of the public streets, your views are very limited because surrounding you are existing housing all around you. So it's not like there's an open view to the coast or the ocean that's being blocked. And by the way, the only protected views from Vista Del Mar or Culver under the Coastal Act, it's to protect views of the ocean or coast from a public scenic highway, right? Not from any other street. If I put up a single story building, right, technically from the street level, you can't see anything. But the fact is, this project does not block views. The staff has so confirmed it. What you have before you is a staff report approving this project that took probably two years to write. It has been studied so densely in, in detail we had to republish and recirculate and mitigated neg deck because this project was filed back in 2012. And we have had a very difficult time getting it moving because of constant opposition and things thrown our way, which are not legal, which I will comment on. 
So back to what the premise of this project is. It's four stories, and it's at 48 feet. Originally, the project was 58. No, 56. I stand corrected. Because the zoning allows 45 feet. And so we got that and density bonus, extra one floor. It was 56. But because of the delays, because of the negotiations and what have you, and the planning department's position that they wanted to uh, limit us to 37 feet as a base and then give us the extra floor, here we are at four stories, 48 feet, and still it's not acceptable to the community, at least portion of the community. Not everyone in the community opposes this. So the Coastal Act, which has been thrown at you, has been analyzed by the staff report. Density bonus, coastal development permit, all these issues extensively reviewed. You're being asked today to reverse all that. So what you have before you is the merger of parcels. Now this is important. This site is, is, is a larger site. It's over 40,000 square feet, has a multiple small parcels. And these parcels are being merged into one parcel so we can have one project. That would happen with anything. This alleyway, and I guess you don't have, I don't know if you have a site plan or you've seen it. This so-called alley bisects the property. And the reason the alley was there is to serve the commercial lot. In other words, if we build a commercial office building, which we could, 60,000 square foot is one and a half to one FAR, or build a, a mall or a retail center or a strip center or any sort of multi-story commercial, you'd have the alley to serve the retail establishments and the offices. With a housing project, it's unnecessary. And so the so-called vacation of that alley, which bisects our own property, which was dedicated years ago by the prior owner of this property to the city, is being basically returned. However, what the, all the departments that reviewed this project have determined, and that is engineering, street services, Department of Transportation, planning, and I'm probably missing a few, is they took the latest plan that the city council adopted for this area, which is Mobility 2035, and applied those standards. And so the street widths that you so heard were a public giveaway are nothing more than compliance with the latest transportation plan this body adopted. That's all it is. The net result is same size building. There's no extra size building here. It's always been 72 units. It hasn't changed. The 72 units, by the way, is less than the zoning and the community plan would allow. The community plan and zoning would allow 96. My client didn't ask for more units. The way my client plans on subsidizing the 11% very low income units for 55 years, by the way, that's what the covenant would be, is by having the market rate units be slightly bigger. As is, the one bedrooms are around 750 to 800 square feet, two bedrooms around 1,000. I don't know why that's considered luxury, but that's the size. The alternative is, if you don't allow that extra floor, is you're asking someone to build micro units, tiny little units, almost like jail sales. And the reality is that the only benefit being obtained here from the density bonus it's not extra units, it is extra floor area. It's an extra floor, so the units are of livable size, which will help subsidize 11% very low income units for 55 years. There has not been a low income project in this area, in this coastal area, for years. This is the first. I went back over the records, over the city records, city surveys, the latest survey that was officially done by the city was from 2006 to 2012, survey of the Playa del Rey area and the coastal area there. In seven years, the survey showed 35 affordable units were built. That's going back to 2012. Since then, I can't find anything. And so, 
where the rubber meets the road here and where the complex, where they, the real issue is, in order to build affordable housing without financial subsidies from a governmental entity, you have a density bonus program promoted by the state, adopted by the city as your own ordinance. You're asking the developer to pay and subsidize for 55 years for these units. In order to do that, the building is going to be slightly bigger, one extra floor. That's what we're getting, one extra floor and a little bit bigger building than the zoning actually permits. And that's what allows the affordability. You take that away, and you have effectively now created, out of the coastal zone, an exclusionary zone. It's like redlining. It's basically saying, in the coastal zone, it's going to be different. We're not going to allow you that extra bulk. We're not going to give you that extra floor. And you know what that means? No affordable housing will get built. It's simple as that. As is, the city has very little coastal space that it regulates, right? You got the Palisades, Pacific Palisades. I'm not aware of any multifamily areas there along the coast you can build. Pretty much all bluffs and cliffs and single family. You've got Venice and you've got Playa del Rey. So if this project really gets rejected on the grounds being articulated for you, basically that the um, Coastal Act, it violates it, and I want to get into that to show you that it doesn't, you've effectively excluded any affordability out of the coastal zone. Now, some of the comments made are very erroneous before you. Before you today is the track map merger of lots approval. If you're going to decide that you're going to deny that, then you've got to make findings to show where the staff made errors. I mean, the staff adopted findings that support this. You can't just willy-nilly deny it, I'm assuming. I haven't heard anyone submit, provide any evidence to show why the staff findings are wrong. Also before you, the last speaker, Mr. Noel Weiss, was wrong. He said density bonus is not before you. It's been appealed. You are sitting as an appellate body on the density bonus and on the coastal development permit requests. Well, uh, on the density bonus, we are within all four squares. There, there's no variances, no exceptions. May I continue, Mr. President? Yes. No, no variances, no exceptions. You can put five minutes on the clock, please. No variances, no exceptions. And it's on all four. So on density bonus, quite frankly, I think the opponents realized there's nowhere to go, and so they picked on the Coastal Act as a tool. And this is kind of really unfortunate because uh, the Coastal Act here is being used as a weapon, if you will, as a, as a sword against uh, denying this project. I heard, I did hear the councilman say the project is incompatible. I didn't hear him say why. Why is it incompatible? Has anyone said that? It's, is it because it's four stories instead of three? Why is it incompatible? So the Coastal Act condition, and by the way, there are several coastal criteria for development, all analyzed in detail within the staff report all the findings were made. So for compatibility, we had submitted to you a notebook. We did a survey, and if you looked at the notebook we gave you and we submitted in the record, there are 114 four-story buildings within Playa del Rey. We gave you photos, we gave you addresses, we gave you a map of where they are. So it can't be that we're incompatible because it's four stories. Now, sure, there are some small little bungalows across the street or in the area. There may be some small old projects there, but that's the reality. So I guess it depends how you want to measure it. Uh, any of the other coastal issues have all been met and addressed. So you, you had a lot of misinformation. I'm not, I can't go into it. I mean, the fact that uh, we don't own the property, we're seeking to, to vacate, things of that nature is silly. Um, but I, I want to hit on, on, on some of the more important items. Um, environmental issues, it's been addressed. Water issues, it's been addressed. Water Board does have jurisdiction. There was a cleaners down there, the street, uh, actually a few blocks away, years ago, that had a plume. 
you know, to argue that the, the sky is falling because we're going to have one level of subterranean, and, and, and you know, I don't know. It, it's like, you know, the only phrase that comes to mind is, um, I wrote it down as I was listening to testimony. Discrimination is the art of misdirection. Okay? Now, I don't know if some famous person maybe said it. I hope not, because I'd like to get credit for that. But you know what? Discrimination is the art of misdirection. All you got to do is start pointing to all kinds of other problems, and you don't have to deal with the main issue. And that's really the problem here, because I see no evidence that a fourth story here ruins the coast, makes it impossible to be able to adopt the local coastal plan. Ridiculous. The Delray Lagoon specific plan that you've heard so much about today. Today we submitted a letter to you with the actual council action from 1982. Okay, even, even Mr. Englander was not around then. And in 1982, the city council basically rejected all the changes made by the Coastal Commission to the so-called Delray Lagoon plan, and they basically tabled it. Yes, they said, oh, let's use it as a policy guide, 1982. But what they said is it's going to be a policy guide because there was the words they used in the staff report, quote, pending adoption of the final ordinance, period. See, in 1982, they thought they are going to adopt the final ordinance, specific plan, which would become the local coastal plan, go back to, commit to the uh, Coastal Commission. The Coastal Commission never certified this plan. I don't care if they uh, sometimes apply it, not apply it. It's never been certified. It's never been adopted by the city. It's not an adopted plan. So think about it. Since 1982, you have since then adopted a new community plan here that affects our property. You've updated that plan. You've put new zoning on this project. You've created a, a coastal uh, transportation corridor plan that affects our property. Mobility 2035, none of them recognize any limitations put on by this so-called Delray Lagoon plan that was never adopted. You have validly adopted ordinances. Are you telling me that validly adopted ordinances are trumped by some policy from 1982 that was never adopted? If you take that position today, you are in violation of the charter, section 558 which specifically says land use regulation must be done through ordinances, specific plans, community plans, zoning. You can't create, may I continue just briefly? Yeah, you could wrap it up. You can't ignore the legal realities here. So, this so-called Delray Lagoon plan, and I've attached to you the recommendations from the committee, the Plum Committee of those days, which basically says several times, we are specifically not adopting this. It says so in the resolution. That's what you're using to try to take away a floor from this project. Which, by the way, the staff, the planning department staff interpretation is even if we apply it, which they did, you still get your extra floor under density bonus. Community believes you don't, or at least the opponents do. They believe it's a hard number. Density bonus doesn't apply. That's wrong, too. Both should apply. Who says one has superiority to the other? But again, it's an unadopted plan. The community plan, there was a misstatement, I have to say, made by the councilman. The community plan for Westchester Playa del Rey does not limit our height to 37 feet for this plan. In fact, it leaves us out. Our sub area on that update allows us 45 feet as a base. The zoning that was granted just 12 years ago allows us 45 feet as a base. So at the end of the day, I know it's a tough choice. I know you're being, you know, you, you have a policy. You like to respect council people. You know, they know their district. I understand council people know their district better than anybody else. But that's not always the case. Because sometimes there are higher policy issues. In this case, there are two issues come to mind. One is the coast. Is the coast a unique 
territory or terrain of Council District 11? Does the coast belong only to Council District 11? Or does it belong to all of your constituents and everybody else who lives in this city? Don't they have a right to have housing? Don't they have a right to have access and live there? Secondly, this, this whole notion of, of affordability and the crisis we have, we have this policy of fair share across the city of housing. Everyone should take a fair share of their burden of housing, including the affordable housing. What you're being asked to do through misdirection is apply a standard that was never adopted by the council and thereby undermine a legitimate density bonus project with very low income units. Oh sure, some people say it's only eight units. What's the big deal? Oh come on, you can do more. You know, that's 11% of the entire project. If every development in this city did 11% of very low income units, we'd be making a real okay. dent into the affordability issue. So, I leave it to you. Obviously, you have to vote your conscience, but you also have to comply with legalities. And subjecting the city to liability, which you would be doing if you denied this project, I think is the wrong thing to do. Um, you would be violating the charter, violating the density bonus law you have, violating your old co coastal development uh, criteria, and applying an unadopted plan to do all this. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, now we could uh, go on to the public spe uh, remaining, remaining uh, public speakers. Neil Brower, Dan Sharkey, Patricia Lyon. Okay, I'm, I'm Dan Sharkey. I've lived okay. for 26 years, 100 yards from ground zero. Mr. Resnick can't have it both ways. He says, well, there's no view from the beach that, because there's houses all around. Then he says, well, this is, there's nothing there. Uh, there's no uh, neighborhoods. Well, that's just false. Um, basically, Legato has to fit in or leave. Fit in or leave. Legato is for destruction of a community. It's all for profit. That's only what they want to develop is profit. If they have to go to micro-sized apartments, that's their problem. As far as your constituents, how many constituents you have, and how are they all going to fit into 70 apartments? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Neil Brower, not here? OK. Uh, we'll wait. We've got Neil's time. OK. Patricia Lyon. After Patricia Lyon is Garrett Smith. Good afternoon. I'm the Planning and Land Use Chair of the Neighborhood Council of Westchester Playa del Rey. So today I represent our Neighborhood Council. This project, commonly known as Legato, located at 138, 140, and 142 Culver Boulevard, has been in our community for discussion and meetings for almost eight years. Legato Company appeared before the Planning and Land Use Committee many, many times has met with the community at large and met with, met with the community at large dozens of times. Our board was about ready to take a position on this project, a position against this project, over four years ago when the Legato Company and its rep representatives, its legal representatives, pulled the project and asked us not to take a position that they did not want us involved in the project. They did not want the Neighborhood Council involved. So from there, it sat dormant, went through council office, worked with the planning department, and we routinely asked what's going on with 138 through 142 Culver Boulevard, never really knowing the outcome until spring of this year, a determination was sent to us indicating that the project was approved with some modifications and changes. 
It did not recognize stakeholder or neighborhood council process or feedback. In spring of this year, our committee and then our board decided to move forward with a community impact statement on this project as presented. There are several key concerns about the project and as a result, our community impact statement was filed with planning and has been filed with Dunn. I have additional copies with me today if they are not in your file. May I have just one more minute? You, uh, you're with the Neighborhood Council and neighborhood council you board submitted a um, Thank impact you. statement. Is that in, has that been submitted? The um, CIS was with the Planning Commission and not the Plum Committee. Okay. We've also submitted it through Dunn, but I do have an ex extra copy. Of okay, if you could, you, have, you could have one more minute. Okay. That's fine. Thank you very much. The key concerns of the project are as follows. It does not re recognize or respect the Delray Lagoon specific plan, which is a working document that has been used as a guideline within our community as an active member of the last community plan and this next community plan, it continues to be incorporated into the formula of our lower Playa del Rey area. The project size, scale, and scope, the mass is a concern to the community and its stakeholders. Density is unusually bad at this intersection and doing anything to enlarge the development will make it even more complex, not only for our coastal beach goers, but all of those people who we know use Playa del Rey as a thoroughfare to the southern beach communities. What we have also seen is the design in the past is not in keeping with the community. Planning department's recommendations supports the vacating of the surrounding areas as you've heard time and time again today. We do not understand Thank the you. vacating of this property from a de with a developer that has nothing to provide it, the community or the city of LA community benefits that would make it even make sense to the local stakeholders. We ask you to support our community plan update because these are very, very key principles. The giving Thank away you. of land in Los Angeles is not usual, but creates further density and further traffic. To date, the developer Thank you very much. If you could finish up there, your last sentence, please. Okay. Thank you. To date, the developer has not presented community benefits to us. We still look for those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Garrett Smith, Ruth Lansford. Good afternoon. There's nothing I can really add uh, to what our councilman has already said. Um, I will tell you, the four and a half years that I've been on neighborhood council, this has been before us in various forms, and there isn't anybody in our community, not a single speaker that said they wanted nothing at this um, location. Unanimously, everyone would agree that um, if it was compatible with the community's 37-foot, um, uh, we would start building tomorrow. And I uh, would like to thank Kathy and um, Julie and Pat and Mike, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Lansford, founder of Friends of Biona Wetlands. Lower Playa del Rey is a small beach community that welcomes thousands of visitors each year. Only one road enters from our town from inland, Culver Boulevard, which narrows as it passes through the Biona Wetlands. We are essentially an island bounded by Santa Monica Bay, the wetlands, the Biona Channel, and LAX. Recognizing this unique situation, our community has worked with our local electeds and statewide agencies devising a plan that limits height and density to cope with these impediments. Several new buildings have gone up respecting our guidelines and we have welcomed them. As for the accusation by Legato that we are a snobbish, limby, nimby neighborhood, I would point out that at least 240 units in Lower Playa del Rey are under rent control. My building, a duplex, is one of them, and most of these units are rented at far below market rate, and many are owner-occupied with long-term tenants. We ask that you respect the reasonable conditions we and Councilman Bonin have established. Do not set a precedent Legato and others will use to destroy our unique community. Thank you. Stephen Goldmaker, Elsie Slifkin McClure. 
residents almost 30 years in Playa del Rey have seen the traffic and the parking go from bad to worse. This project will not help that. What I was going to say has been said better than I could by Mike Bonin and several other people. I want to reiterate that I'm with them. And the worst thing about this project is that it would be a gateway for developers. If this is approved, the next one will get in line and use this as an excuse to go higher and the next and the next. And our community will be dominated, overtopped, and pretty much destroyed by rampant development. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elise Slifkin McClure. And I, am, I live in Playa del Rey, and I am not anti-development. I am anti-overdevelopment. As many people have said, the height, scope, and density of this Lugato plan development is completely out of character with our community. People have talked about the height limit in the Coastal Commission, and people have talked about the domino effect. But I want to revisit it with something, some history, because I've been to all of these meetings since the beginning. So first of all, as Julie read, Gary Entrican, who owns at least eight neighboring parcels for sale, has put in writing that they, they support Legato's plan as long as they have the same right for their properties to be at this oversized, above coastal commission limit height. The other thing you want to know is, is that in the beginning, Legato presented all of their parcels together. So they have the current parcel at 138 through whatever number it is, Culver. They have one adjacent to it. They have the one of the last remaining beachfront sand dune areas right at the end of Culver Boulevard. And they had planned to develop all of these parcels to this, to the 56 foot height, really. Maybe some were varied, but very much similar. I don't think it's an accident that they went and took it, or taking it one parcel at a time, because they're counting on the domino effect. They're counting on if they get the approval for this building to be beyond the Coastal Commission height limit, that they'll get it for all of their other properties. And as far as this thing about low-income housing, it's not that we're not for that. It's not that we're not for diversity. We're just really w opposed to Legato ruining our community and ruining what's possible by the beach. If they, someone else said it, 37 feet, we'd all say fine. And we've done that with every other thing that's been presented there. Mark Mitchell, Joy Ross, May, Ross Meisel, Sarah Kay. Mark's not here. What's your name, sir? Howard Neller. Howard? Yes. Did you sign up to speak? Howard Neller from... Okay, Howard, Howard Neller, go right ahead. Thank you. I would like you to forget all the rules that you heard about Postal Commission and things like that, just put on your logical thinking hat and say 72 units and 84 parking spots. Doesn't make sense. Where are those other 60 cars going to go? Those street, park, those street parking spots are gone years ago. So there's going to be another, you know, there'll be round and round, just like every Friday night, Saturday night, when People from Playa Vista come looking for something to eat at the beach, circle around our buildings all over the place. This does not make sense. The last thing is narrowing Culver Boulevard. Thousands of kids and families every weekend go across that street, across those intersections of Playa del Rey, Vista del Mar, and Culver Boulevard. And narrowing that street is a tragedy waiting to happen. That's where the bus stops. That's where people get off. That's where they take their, their, their surfboards. I mean, it's, un, it's crazy. So please adhere to what we're trying to say. This has been a failure to communicate. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Joy Ross Meisel. I live at 130 Convoy Street. 
the back of our home looks directly at that site. I would love to have something nice to look at, and a nice development within the proper height limit, within the proper uh, dimensions. 72 units without proper parking would be a nightmare in our area. It's a nightmare in our area for parking as it is now. 123 spots is inadequate, and that's with retail. So it, it's, the project is way oversized. It doesn't belong in this area. We would definitely support one that was in the right height limit and with the proper parking. Thank you. Thank you. The Coastal Commission through the Coastal Act has provided explicit parking requirements for development in the coastal zone. This is to safeguard a top priority of protecting beach access, not only for the residents of the coastal city, but for all visitors from all of your districts. We've conducted a zip code and parking survey to understand the current accessibility of Playa del Rey, which has been submitted into the council file. As was no surprise, visitors came from all over the city, and the most typical parking experience was at least 30 minutes of circling, often an hour, and one family four hours. If Legato is allowed to build their significantly underparked project, our visitor access will go from frustrating to nearly impossible, and the residential overflow will turn Playa del Rey into an exclusive community where only the privileged residents can access the beach and parks. This is not only unacceptable to the Coastal Commission, but unacceptable to the community of Playa del Rey. As stewards of this town and beach, we will not allow our neighboring communities to bear the consequences of Legato's failure to provide adequate and safe parking. And since I have a little extra time, I want to introduce myself and give a face to what Councilman Bond was talking about, about already present affordable housing and rent controls. I moved to Playa del Rey three and a half years ago. I'm a Pilates and yoga instructor and pet sitter, and as you can imagine, I can't afford luxury housing. Yet this community has welcomed me and integrated me. It is not exclusionary. And although I live in what Mr. Resnick would call a jail cell, I'm happy to live here and I'm happy to be here defending my town. Thank you. Marcia Hanscom, Hanscom. Richard Harmel. Honorable Council Members, Marcia Hanscom, representing the Biona Wetlands Institute and the Sierra Club, who I've worked with since 1995 on protecting the Biona Wetlands in this area. And I'd like to suggest that uh, the lawyer for Legato and Ed Zucker, who said that the Coastal Act has been thrown at you, is a little bit off base. The Coastal Act is here to protect all of the citizens in California and protect the coast for those citizens and public access for that. And that's why you are you have actually a separate obligation to uh, uphold the Coastal Act besides the Coastal Commission also doing that. There are three sections I want you to think about. Section 30230, Section 30231, and Section 30232. And the reason is those sections of the Coastal Act require that you protect the near shore waters and the wetlands in the area, which are immediately adjacent to this property. Those toxic chemicals will be moving on top of this very high water table if this project is allowed to right. proceed. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Richard Harmel, Davis Merceru, Mark Drollinger. Good afternoon, my name is Richard Harmel. I'm a 25-year resident of the Delray community and a business owner. I would like to raise a point of clarification. I just heard counsel for the applicant state something to the effect that because the applicant is including affordable housing in his project, that he is entitled to a fourth floor. If we follow that line of reasoning, it would extend to the point of saying as a result of being entitled to the fourth floor of housing, he would be entitled to break the regulations and laws of the Coastal Act, exceeding the 37-foot the limit for the height that's indicated in that act. 
I urge the council members to support the appeal and to oppose this project. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Davis Mercero and I live on Vista Del Mar. Like my fellow Playa Del Rey residents, I reject and do not support the approval of this development. Legato threatens the very core, literally main street nature of our town and yet would like to present our community as anti-affordable housing and exclusive. This is deliberately false. If approved, it will specifically be this development that will forever drive up the cost of living in Playa Del Rey with the addition of unwanted franchise retail and market rate housing. This will have a life-changing negative impact, particularly on the more than 45 people who both work and live in Playa del Rey, such as myself. The undesirable effect this will have on our community will be perfectly desirable for Legado, the developer, which means legacy in Spanish. The legacy this development will leave behind will be excess, not progress. In closing, I want to remind this council that Los Angeles was founded as a collection of villages and remains so today if and only when we choose to protect its community rights. Playa del Rey, sorry, is our village and without self-control, within the equal scope of protection, we will lose preservation of that village permanently. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mark, Cindy Hardeen, Brian Drawer. Uh, hi, my name is Mark Drollinger. I'm with Citadel Environmental. Um, the studies that we've done out there show that... Can you speak uh, into the microphone, please, or raise the microphone? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me now? Y yes. No? Lift the mic. You can move it up. Yeah, yeah there you go. How about now? That's better. Okay. Uh, Mark Rollinger with Citadel Environmental. Uh, based on the studies that we've done out there, um, we, uh, and, and the current uh, configuration of the project, it doesn't look like permanent dewatering is needed out there. We stand by that at this point. Um, the methane issues um, will be addressed through the LA City Department of Building and Safety. Um, the only requirement that they'll have is a membrane system underneath the uh, slab, as well as a, uh, a vent system, which will be horizontal pipes above the water line. Um, in terms of the, um, the dry cleaner, uh, while there have been uh, some solvents found there, uh, the regional board is the uh, regulatory authority on that and they are currently looking at that. They're gonna have a site characterization done and the amount of money that they've received from the state will be sufficient to do the site characterization as well as um, the remediation. Um, most of those sites can be characterized under $100,000. Um, so, so we don't really see that there's gonna be any impact from the dry cleaner going towards the property or the, uh, the, the project site. Um, there's just not gonna be enough dewatering. The biggest ele uh, elephant in the room is the Pacific Ocean. If there's going to be any kind of uh, um, flow towards the site, it's probably going to be impacted by that. Um, uh, so, uh, and then also for the uh, remediation of uh, the dry cleaner, um, you're going to see that they're going to be controlling that uh, plume coming off site. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Cindy Hardin, and I am a resident and also work in Playa del Rey. My, my place of employee is actually the Bayona Wetlands. I am concerned about an insufficient analysis of groundwater and the potential threat to the delicate ecosystem that is the Bayona Wetlands and the Pacific Ocean. Um, groundwater moves around all the time, as was stated previously, and it is very close to the surface there. Once groundwater is contaminated, it is virtually impossible to clean up. In addition, the giving of 10 feet of Culver Boulevard, to which Mr. Resnick himself refers to as a public street, seems to me a violation of public rights. Um, if anyone's talking 10 feet, it should be a 10-foot setback, in my opinion. The project as proposed exceeds the 37-foot height limit of the Delray Lagoon plan, which will set a precedent that will permanently alter the character of our small, sweet community. Um, I beg you to reconsider the plan as proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, if I may, before my time starts, I have a packet of information I'd like to give to the committee members. Sure, the Sergeant at Arms will take that from you. Thank you. Also, I'm wearing this hat, meaning no disrespect. I just want to make sure everyone sees the city of Los Angeles comes first. Okay. 
Good afternoon, Chairman, committee members, and staff. My name is Brian Dror. I grew up on Fowling Street in Playa del Rey, where my mother still lives today. I am here in support of the project, and I urge this committee to make a finding and a recommendation to support the hardworking members of the planning staff, the planning department, the planning commission, and to recommend approval to the city council. Besides stating the obvious need for affordable housing, especially in a coastal zone, in truth, I could never do a better job arguing in favor of this project than Mike Bonin has done in the past few years. I've handed you now a collection of some of his most public statements. I won't read all of them, just the three I find most telling. Los Angeles has a tremendous affordable housing crisis, and we need to examine every strategy possible to address it. Every single unit of affordable housing is imperative for our city. He has called the affordable housing shortage an ex existential crisis for the city that threatens the very concept of what Los Angeles stands for. I could go on, but what I really want to know after hearing his comments is where is the real Mike Bonin and what have you done with him? Because you see, the real Mike Bonin would support a project of affordable housing, as would each and every one of you in your districts. We must put Los Angeles first. We can't put any, any personal agenda or politics in front of what this city needs. If you feel the developer maybe isn't doing enough, tell him what you need to give him an approval. We must build affordable housing in this city. This may seem like a very personal issue to me, and in truth it is, because at this very moment I am personally involved in financing, ownership, and development of over 1,500 affordable and homeless units in this city, not to mention another 15,000 nationwide. I promise you in this room, no one is doing more for affordable housing than I am, certainly not from the opponents. I am, I am doing my part. Please do what's right and do your part. Vote for approval. Thank you. Ron Yersh. Ellen Rezerchoy, Jeffrey Otto, Good afternoon. My name is Ron Hirsch. I'm a principal at Hirsch Green Transportation Consulting. Uh, my firm, uh, is it not on? Is that better? Uh, my name is Ron Hirsch. I'm a principal at Hirsch Green Transportation Consulting. My firm prepared the traffic studies uh, for this project. Uh, I'd like to briefly address uh, some of the uh, traffic related issues that have been raised uh, in the appeal. Uh, We've been working on this project for a long time. The original traffic study was prepared in 2011 uh, and was subsequently updated with a revised reduced project uh, in 2013. Uh, that study concluded that there were no significant traffic related impacts uh, and LADOT uh, reviewed and approved that study uh, concurring uh, with our conclusions. Uh, LADOT also uh, issued uh, a new assessment letter in August of last year uh, updating the uh, street uh, vacation uh, information uh, to the current Mobility Plan 2035 standards, uh, design standards, and in that letter uh, also reaffirmed uh, their approval uh, of the original uh, 2013 traffic study. Uh, our traffic study included 26 related projects, including uh, the, uh, the assumed full build-out of Playa Vista, uh, as well as the other two Legato projects that have been mentioned, uh, as well as a general overall uh, traffic growth factor. Uh, the study, uh, including the traffic data, uh, was current at the time uh, it was reviewed and approved, and although the processing of this project has been uh, significantly delayed uh, since the uh, traffic study was, uh, was prepared, uh, due to the conservative assumptions regarding traffic growth factors uh, in the area uh, and the fact that no new significant development has occurred in the area uh, in recent years, uh, this study and its conclusions remain valid. Uh, thank you very much. I'm available for questions. Thank you. I'm Ellen Reeser Choi, and I play in Play Del Rey. I go there because of the lagoon, and the condition of the lagoon is very poor. The water is so low, it's lost its uh, access to the ocean. If there is something, it's a very small amount, and so it doesn't have the tidal flow. I'm worried about the 
the toxic water being pulled into the lagoon. There's over the years since I've been going there as a kid, the the quality of the the um, birds and the all that wildlife. There's less and less of it every year, and I just would I would hate for it to just go away. The building would tower over the neighborhood. All those people would have pri uh, problems with their privacy rights, just like they do over at uh, Westchester. Um, on La Tijera and Sepulveda Eastway. And the parking is already congested. They closed the lots at, over by the channel to use for construction. And so parking is really a premium. And for them to remove what little they have and the safety for those people that live in that area to commerce around and avoid the dangers on, on Vista del Mar. You know, it, you guys, please, I ask you to grant the appeal and to stop or limit the project to 37 feet. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey, Lucy Taylor, Chris Bozeman. My name is Jeffrey Otto, and I've been a resident of Playa del Rey for over 30 years. I'm a CPA and have been in public practice for 40 years. I have been and currently am a consultant for billion dollar mixed use real estate developments in North America. It doesn't take my expertise to note that the proposed development is out of character to the community. The developer's parking study is flawed. The traffic study is a farce. If the developer to lose their density bonuses, their return on investment would still exceed what would be considered a reasonable rate of return. On top of this, the development plan does not mitigate the likely environmental damage to the neighboring wetlands nor the serious health hazards to the community when a known toxic plume residing under a now closed dry cleaner in downtown Playa del Rey is pulled through the community. This damage will be followed by lawsuits and the city of Los Angeles will end up holding the bag. Use some common sense, please. Yes to development, that's what I do for a living. No to this flawed development. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Mosman. I live in Playa del Rey. I live up the hill, uh, about five to 10 minute walk from this property on Manchester. Uh, the area I live in, it's pretty dense with high rise buildings and I even watched one uh, be built across the street from me kind of okay with that. I, pr I might even be okay with this development up the street. What's unique about where this property is, it's in the middle of town. It, it's like a town square. And um, it has views of the bluff, views of the ocean. Um, and um, it's, it's unique to Los Angeles, it's unique to California. Um, the building proposes oversized and it dwarfs its surroundings. It disrupts the landscape, it disrupts the historic equity of the area one that would be lost forever. This area is tiny. You see, what further worries me is that this proposal sets a dangerous precedent for other developments to follow suit. We all want the lot developed, no question. We can improve upon this area and complement the village. We can add much needed housing, we support that. But we can't develop carte blanche at an irreparable price. It's critical to be a protector here today of California resources and responsible development. Please grant this appeal. I don't understand, or maybe I do, why Mr. Resnick is so flippant about the Coastal Act, a respected institution. He would have to change his tone if they were here today. So, how, you know, I, I kind of know why, because it's in direct threat to his wealthy client's plans. This is about luxury units. And uh, so I, I just implore you to, to pay attention to these facts. Thank you. Lucy, Nellie Schumann, Charlie Carno. Hi, my name is Lucy Taylor. Um, I've lived and worked in and around Playa del Rey for 23 years. Uh, this project requested an 11 foot on menu height incentive. The project is located across an alley called Trolley Place from an R1 lot, the city's lot referenced in the director's determination. Los Angeles. Municipal Code Section 122.25 provides, quote, no additional height shall be permitted for any portion of a building in a housing development project located on a lot across an alley from a lot classified in an R1 or more restrictive zone. There is an exception for a project located close to a transit stop, but the only bus in the area, the 115 Metro, is not a metro rapid bus on a metro rapid route and does not qualify as a transit stop. So if a height incentive is awarded, it is off menu 
and the notices for the project were not properly issued and the incentives under the city code have not been followed. I froze the project. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Natalie Schumann and I'm a member of Unite Here Local 11. I'm here today in support of the community and in opposition to the proposed project in Playa del Rey. This project has some very significant environmental issues that the environmental assessment prepared does not fully take into account, for example, the liquefaction and dewatering issues as well as cumulative impacts of the development. The project is very large for the area and will obstruct public views for both residents and visitors. This is out of step with the key provisions of the Coastal Act. Uh, I echo the, the statements of opposition that have been made before me and I, I would urge the, the committee to reject this project and approve the appeals. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Charlie Carno and I'm with Unite Here. Just want to echo what, what members of the community have said here today and oppose the proposed project. this proposed project. We've come here um, to support real affordable housing measures, the linkage fee, additional housing opportunities in the, in the community plans and in the, and, and in the transit neighborhood plans, but this is the wrong project. We, our union has a record of defending the Coastal Act. This is in flagrant violation of its provisions. It will, it, will, it will actually prevent the future development of a consistent local coastal program for the area. It takes away the public street parking that enables people to access the coast. And, it's, and as a resident of LA, I like to be able to access the beach and use it for recreation. And this project will make it more difficult for visitors to find parking and access the beach. So I urge you to reject this project as proposed. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Al Farmer, or Ellie Farmer, Lorenzo Brown, Viking M. Good afternoon, uh, Councilman. Uh, so I'm a member of Unite Here Local 11. My name is Al Farmer. Uh, I urge you to accept the appeals uh, that are before you today and reject this project. Uh, the CPC was in error when it approved it. And it is so good that so many members of the community are here today to oppose this project and to show uh, their support and Councilman Bonin uh, speaking to, uh, to reject this project and grant these appeals. There are, uh, from these comments and from the record, there are numerous things in there that allow you uh, to see that there is substantial evidence that there are significant impacts that are unaddressed by the mitigated negative declaration for this project. Uh, there needs to be a full environmental impact report that needs to be circulated through the community. Um, this, this project does not have support from the community. You can see that. And it is privatizing access to the beach, something we do not need. Um, a paltry number of, of some affordable units tacked onto what is a multi-million dollar luxury development on the beach is not something that Los, Angel Los Angeles needs. It's not something that this community needs, and they know that. Uh, and it's not going to help our affordability crisis any, but it will limit access to the beach for all Angelinos. Um, the, uh, the, your committee can make a decision on the whole record that is before you, and there are multiple pieces of substantial evidence from liquefaction to parking to the effects on the Coastal Act, uh, the effects on our water. Um, you've got plenty of evidence before you to make the right decision. I urge you to accept the appeals of this project and reject, uh, uh, reject it from you today. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members, committee members, members of the Playa community. Thank you all. My name is Lorenzo Brown. I'm a community organizer and housing advocate. Um, I want to urge you to support this project. I want you to deny this appeal. It's not going to do anything. It's nonsense. Um, members of the Playa community, I'm an African American. I, I don't want to really move to your community. Um, I don't think the people that don't have the money to live in your community want to live there. This place is actually for you guys. It's actually for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. It's going to be a beautiful centerpiece in the zone where it is. I went and walked around it. It's in a low place. It's not blocking anything. It's the lowest point there with the access to the beach as far as that goes. Um, all of these things that you guys are bringing up 
to be elitist or economic segregationist or whatever it is, it makes no sense whatsoever. We need housing. We're in a housing crisis in LA, a state of emergency. And the people where I live at, down in Skid Row, we need housing. We don't want to come there and get it, but we want you to be able to get it so we can get housing elsewhere. Please, please, please approve this project. My name is Vikan Markarian. I'm a member of the community outreach team. I'm also a realtor, and I want, I want to let you guys know that there's limited amount of rentals within the proposed project. Due to the limited space inventory of rentals, the prices have surged, where it's difficult to get something decent within the proposed area. This new project will not only give opportunity for people to live in a brand new building, but enjoy the new downtown Playa del Rey that it will create. Thank you. Thank you. Pablo L, Zvi Jari, Joan Howard. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pablo Luján, and I'm part of the community outreach team. I live in Marina del Rey, and I commute by bike to Playa del Rey. I support this project because it will bring progress in terms of affordable housing as well as facilitating sustainable and active transportation in Los Angeles, which is highly needed. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Zvi Jari. Hi, hi and good afternoon. Zvi Jari. Um, when I hear the word affordable housing, I hear minorities. And when we had the same conversation in Van Nuys for the hearing, I don't see much of a difference. The only diversity I see here, is it gray hair or silver hair? I drive for Uber, I drive for Lyft. I, every morning, without a fail for the last month or two, every morning. I gotta pick up somebody with their luggage because they have to find a place to live because they're moving from couch to couch. There is not, everybody's talking about, there is not, not only not affordable housing, there's no housing at all, period, in this city. There's so many people moving in and there's no place to live. I've, I've been to places where people are sharing eight people in one apartment because they have no choice. A lot of people like to live in Los Angeles, and it's not a privilege. That's it. Thank you. Joan Howard, uh, yes. Timothy Sterry, Patricia Lyon, who already spoke. So we'll take that out. I'm Joan. I work for an outreach. I work as I work. Oh, sorry. I've been working for two days. I do outreach for a nonprofit. We turn the functional into taxpayers. We give them housing and jobs. A lot of the people who come to me are middle class. They cannot afford to live anywhere. They spend 90% of their salaries on housing. And you're faces, facing a tsunami of the middle class right now with no end in sight. But I want to break this up. I hear a lot about luxury housing. There's nothing but little tiny apartment houses being built up and down the coast. They're small, but they're all luxury. Thousands of apartments and not one affordable unit. If you want your first responders, your teachers, your librarians to have something to live in, you'll allow it. Please, please, please start, start throwing out the restrictions and allowing affordable housing every single place you can. Because if you don't, you're going to be looking at a third world country in this place, including Playa. Uh, Timothy Sterry. Um, I'm, I'm voting to support this project. Uh, again, not, not only is affordable housing extremely hard to come by in this city, any sort of housing has been mentioned. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very hard pressed to find anybody that's 48 feet tall that whose, whose view this is going to obstruct. You know, uh, again, unless you're walking down the street right now and looking at an empty lot full of some overgrown grasses, I don't, I, you know, why not put a, you know, a new structure up there that will actually help the community, help your own community? Maybe, I don't know if you have any, uh, you know, 
the small mom and pop shops there, you know, maybe having these folks living here might help bring in some business. Also, you know, talking about the parking, it, it, with, with these 72 units, which is a, a pretty small amount in my opinion, if there's so many more extra parking spaces, you're not gonna have to worry about people coming in and looking for parking, they're already living there on the beach. So, you know, do the math. Mar Marin Kukuruzu Uza, John Cosgrove, Marcus Montgomery, Rich Wasp, Hector Barbosa, Hi, I am Marin Kukuruza. Um, I am in support of this project because of the great need for affordable housing in every community within Los Angeles. I don't understand how the eight feet of difference between what is deemed an acceptable height and what is being proposed for this project will ruin, ruin the aesthetic of the community, especially taking into consideration what it will offer. Um, I just think it's a terribly important issue and like has been talked about before, um, Every single unit of affordable housing is one family, one community member that isn't gonna be on the streets. And um, every life matters. My name is Marcus Montgomery and I'm a Playa del Rey resident and business owner. There needs to be much more housing for hardworking people like myself who present a need for affordable housing. As a young adult that lives and works in Playa del Rey, I should continue to be allowed to live and contribute to the Playa Vista community with some respect paid to the fact that I work full time and pay my own way. Please keep in mind the current need for more lower income housing units. It is not a privilege to live where I work and with housing in general, respect should be paid to the residents of my community by continuing to create more affordable housing units like those that will be built. Thank you. going to speak from the heart if you don't mind. Um, my name is Rich, last name is Wasp. I work with the uh, Peggy B Foundation that does uh, homeless, um, we feed the homeless every Tuesday and I also work with the uh, Christian Community Center. We have a youth out outreach program and the fact of the matter is that we have a huge, huge issue with, with housing and you know be it, may, be it, be it that it may, it may be a uh, luxury unit but it, the fact of the matter is they're still trying to put a dent in you know the need affordable housing I myself am you know someone who can benefit from projects like this and to be honest with you if 10 feet you know affects your community that bad then you have a weak community we need to go ahead and get this thing approved and start putting a dent in this in this issue thank you Hello everyone, my name is Hector M. Barbosa. I'm here to support this project and I wanna say something that, um, I, I came here not really knowing what to say, but you know, I recalled doing this proceeding um, a couple of things that happened over the 2000s. Uh, uh, some members of my family who are quite affluent, they were looking for where to live and what to invest in the west side. And I remember that a lot of the proposals during this time were rejected using two words, decay and decline. Okay, these words st stick out in my mind because I see a lot of communities that that is what is happening to. I want you to consider in this beautiful community where they're going to be 20, 30 years from now and what we need to do today to not only meet the needs of the people, but also to revitalize this uh, community and bring the future forth. Thank you. John Cosgrove, have you spoken? No. Not here. Lenganji Chase Siame. Reichen Welch. Christopher Kumiega, Brian Smith, Ruth Myers. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mr. Langanji Chaseyami, and um, I'm happy that uh, um, an area has been found in the city of Los Angeles for the uh, a, a 
development of an apartment building. Um, it's a good thing that uh, we are considering for uh, affordable housing to be included. Um, I am totally in support of this project and um, I hope that uh, uh, the right resources can be pulled together to have it built. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Nice seeing you all again. Uh, my name is Ryan Welch. I was a member of the community outreach team who was working on behalf of Legato, speaking with neighbors. I would like to first uh, correct uh, uh, Councilmember Bonin's uh, misstatement that the uh, majority of the residents of Playa del Rey are against this project. That was not my experience at all. I found most people to be in support of this project, in support of more retail in their community in support of improvement to that section of the neighborhood, which is very run down. I would also like to, um, I would also like to recognize the wonderful business owners that I met in that neighborhood. Uh, many uh, small business owners uh, right there where uh, surrounding the neighborhood, surrounding where that project would be. Um, quite unfortunately, um, uh, they were not allowed to uh, come out and and support uh, under threat of, of uh, and, and intimidation. Um, but I would like to say that, uh, you know, the, the, fo the folks here should be thinking about their local businesses and how up, they're going to survive yeah. 20 yeah. years down the road when they're no longer able to patronize those, those wonderful places. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Ruth Myers and I'm a housing advocate who has worked directly on this project. I ask you to approve this project as there are many reasons to do so, but most importantly, it will provide very low and market rate housing. We need both. We are in a housing crisis and all of Los Angeles needs to do its part to meet our housing goals, including Playa del Rey. You have heard that this project is out of scale or character with Playa, yet there are several four-story buildings within a stone's throw of this vacant lot, a lot, a lot which displaces no one and could potentially be the home to 72 individuals or families. The very vocal and visceral opposition would have you believe that they represent the whole of Playa. They do not. They would have you believe that they care about their community and are so welcome, but that is only if you agree with them. They are tearing their community apart because there is no reason that we cannot conduct ourselves in a decent manner and engage in a constructive dialogue. Every constituent has a right to be heard without being intimidated and harassed. If you look at the nearly $4 million price tag attached to cost, the cost alone of building those eight very low income units, it does not pencil out to remove a floor without removing those units. Hence the SB 1818 bonus for which this project meets the requirements. Thank you for your time. Please approve this project. Thank you. Oksan Spite, Austin Sire, Neil Brower, we called already, I believe. Eric Coford. And that's the last of our speakers. Good afternoon, council members. My name afternoon. is Eric Coford. I have lived in Playa del Rey for an excess of 40 years. The the Delgado project is the beginning of a long-awaited renewal of Calvo Boulevard. It will feed new life to the old and tired Boulevard as we open up opportunity to present and future generations. Our town should be a welcoming town with an eye to the future generations. Yeah. Please support the project with approval. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Austin Sear. I'm a housing advocate and I have conducted much of the outreach in Playa del Rey on behalf of this project. I came prepared with a bunch of emotional, emotional statements that have been put together based on my time working in here, but emotion is what has gotten us to this point. And while we're all emotional beings, and I understand everybody who's involved in this housing conversation, because I feel those same emotions as well. No one likes construction, no one likes traffic, no one likes the changing character of neighborhoods. But housing is such a layered conversation, 
I want to keep the emotion out of it and just stick to some of the facts with it. We have such a deficit of housing creation. Last time I checked in this decade, we build one unit of housing for every five people that are here. Playa del Rey is a special place, as is Venice, as is Koreatown, as is West Hollywood, as is all of these conversations and all these cities where the conversations are generally the same. This project makes sense. It's a vacant lot. We're displacing nobody. Please approve. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Roxanne Spade. I want to thank this body for its time. I've been a housing advocate for over 10 years in uh, Los Angeles County. I am in favor of this project. Uh, I listened to all the testimony today, and the opposition wants us to believe that if it drops to 37 feet, it's going to eliminate all the concerns about the water table, the views, the parking, the plume, the height, the scope, the density, the domino effect. If you just take away those eight units, all of that is going to go away, and it will no longer be an issue, is what I've heard today. Uh, I stand here, and there are many uh, homeowners and business owners of Playa del Rey that are unable to come out today. I thank Eric for being here. Uh, to date, I don't know if Council Member Bonin has taken the time to sit down with the supporters of this project, the undecided of this project, for him to say that he speaks for the majority when we've tapped on over 8,000 doors. That is not the case. So uh, emotional appeal, it sounds like it should override expert, uh, expert opinion, like the experts aren't qualified is what I'm hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kent Gensler. I'm actually- I'm sorry, sir, what's your name? Kent Genslinger. Are you, were you uh, scheduled to speak? I don't I was. I'm actually one of the appellants, but I could not get here in time because I was actually doing uh, it here. There's a gentleman here that's named Noel Weiss that took up your time. He stood up and said he was your representative. Yeah. So. Okay. What well, I, your time is, you, you've spoken three representative already, sir. What I was saying is the reason I wasn't here is because I was finishing jury duty. Yeah. So by doing one civic duty, I was unable to be here to do a second okay. civic duty. So okay. I I'd apologize. like to know if the I council would give me uh, compassion to say, speak my piece. I apologize. If we had gotten notice beforehand, we would take that and certify or look at the documentation. Otherwise, we get a number of people up here uh, saying a number of things, and we don't know if we could believe it or not. Well, you had given us notice I'm not before. Lying. I could show you my jury. jury and your notes. representative spoke already, sir. Thank okay. you. I, I apologize. Um, that, uh, Neil Brower is our last speaker. Mr. Resnick, uh, you spoke already. Right. Yes. Neil Brower put in, I think, a public speaking card. Uh, he's an associate with our office. Um, well, he can he I, could can speak. I speak for him or not? No, we okay. don't allow people is to gonna, sign up for other people. Right. Is there going to be any more opportunity? Or no, we, that, no, we don't. Or anything? Unlike the court system, we don't okay. go back and forth. We just no, have no, people make their presentation, that. and that's it. Okay. Thank you. So that concludes our, uh, our public speaking. Uh, we'll go to now to questions or comments from committee members. Anybody? Mr. Anglander? Yeah, just a, uh, I think more clarification perhaps from our city attorney, if I, if I could. Uh, there's been a, a lot of back and forth with um, some of the arguments that were made by some of the proponents of the project as well as some of the um, opponents, uh, both the appellants and the applicants. Uh, and it seemed to stem mostly in terms of the legalities, and that's where I'm looking at this, and what the, the decision and the vote is before this body. Um, in looking at the, uh, f the height, for example, from the 37 to 45, um, it's being obtained, from my understanding, and is through the density bonus for exchange of some of the affordable housing units. Um, and that's under state law, is that correct? Correct. Density bonus comes from state okay. law. And then, and then some of the folks that were saying, though, though that height um, doesn't conform with either the local planning, um, area planning, and or uh, in the specific plan or community plan, and or the coastal commission. And so there seems to be some conflict between, um, and I think many of the speakers alluded to that too, uh, as well as the council member of the district. And, and I, for one, uh, will always say that a council member in their own district certainly knows their community best. 
Uh, and not only that, he didn't send a representative or write a letter, but was here personally. Uh, but I'm still a little confused, though, on because that seems to be most of, I mean, there were a lot of other arguments, but that's what I heard for the most part to be the most consistent. Um, and the letters and phone calls we received as well, that's what I heard the, the bulk of. So it wasn't just the testimony here today, but collectively. So on that, um, which one prevails? So um, actually, it's interesting. Um, I think a comment was made by someone that um, suggested that the density bonus case was actually before this committee um, and the way that our code is written the two items that are before you are an appeal of the tentative tract decision and the coastal development permit so although coastal development um, and density bonus are both in state law what's before you is actually the CDP and so you look to the standards for um, whether or not the, the uh, appeal uh, of the CDP is righteous um, there are cases where the two do um, meet and uh, the findings uh, for consistency with um, the Coastal Commission Act do not, um, do not land in the same place that the, the findings for denying a density bonus do. They're separate. Um, the, the facts of the density bonus aren't really before you. It's whether the project is consistent with the, the Coastal Act. And here, the argument is being made that the character of the neighborhood is um, at issue. And uh, under, I think, the sections that were cited, uh, 30251 of the Public Resources Code, there is language that says that um, permitted development shall be cited and designed to be visually, visually compatible with the surrounding areas. Is that subjective? Well, it's dependent on whether there's substantial evidence um, that you can say meets that, that finding. So if you heard today substantial evidence that allows you to make that finding, then that is um, something that you can consider in determining whether this appeal should be granted or denied. Okay. And, um, and so with that, too, um, it was suggested by the, um, the applicant's representative who spoke uh, for I, I, well over 15 minutes and gave the presentation um, that uh, those findings were, were there and that it met the objective and then it was argued um, by some others that it, that it didn't. Um, I, I would suggest, uh, well, I wouldn't even suggest, I, I, would, I would bet and guarantee that no matter what we do here, uh, Mr. Chair, no matter what happens in council, this isn't the final vote and the council isn't the final vote, and this is probably not even the, the body that will make the final decision. I've seen these too, too many times for too many years. Um, this will be tried not in the court of public opinion or before this body, but probably a court of law. Um, I have no doubt um, that that's where this is headed. Uh, and, um, and, and because of the sort of gray areas in this, if you will, um, I don't think it's crystal clear that there's a path to say with certainty uh, that this is or is not compatible, uh, period. And I would defer more to the community that lives there and the council member of the district. Uh, but even saying that, at the end of the day, that's where I would suggest it probably goes. So in the interest of caution for me, um, what I would suggest is uh, putting forth, I will put forth a motion then to move this, to close the public comment, to move this to the full city council uh, with no recommendation from this committee. Uh, and so give us a little more, perhaps, uh, view in between now and council to look at some of those nuances because I heard some arguments today that I hadn't heard in previous communications and I for one would be more comfortable in certainly looking into those as well. Also knowing full well um, there's a high probability, particularly given the uh, litigious nature of the representative of the applicant, that this is exactly where it's going to end up as in court. Um, and so, um, and which is unfortunate because I, I would much rather just see closure to these kinds of things than to waste taxpayer funds litigating and go with the will of the people. But I think that's where we ultimately end up. So with that, that's what I would suggest, and that will be my motion. Okay. Thank you. Mr. 
Christ, any questions or comments on this? Uh, no, sir. No. Okay. One thing that I, I wanted to clarify is that um, they brought up the issue that the coastal development plan, the Delray Lagoon, uh, was never adopted and only in place as a policy too. Can we clarify that? Cause, because there seems to be contradictory testimony on both sides. From our staff, please. Yeah. Faisal Roble. Uh, yes, this was adapted in concept, approved in concept, which means that the guidelines that were approved in concept are uh, available to the decision maker is when they so desire, they can sometimes apply the way they feel like to shape a project. We have a lot of design guidelines in the plan department historically that decision makers can use to make some decisions, and, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's not an ordinance. Okay, so what does that mean if we are um, basing a project and or a decision on that uh, um, that plan, uh, it, does it, uh, can we, can we not, or, or, or are we using it just as a tool? It is a tool that is available to you to make some of the decisions as the last decision making body okay. uh, without trumping other ordinances or other uh, regulations. But, but it's not fatal, correct? I mean, it's we could use it, but it's not fatal. We do use, and City Planning Commission, APC, they all use when such uh, uh, design guidelines are available. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, well, there's been a motion made uh, to send it forward without recommendation. Uh, there are three members present. Um, uh, I would, ask, I would uh, uh, entertain that motion and, uh, and move that as uh, made by Mr. Uh, Englander. I'll second it. And seconded by Mr. Price. Um, is there any other, uh, We'll move that forward without objection then. Uh, move forward without recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. And for the public, this for you to know, this moves to full council without a recommendation. Full council still has to take a vote on it. The public at the, uh, and uh, there's been a public hearing that's been closed. Yeah, thank you. Next uh, item is uh, general public comment. We have one speaker, Doug Haynes. Doug Haynes, are you still here? Mr. Haynes, as, as he comes up, you want you have something to say, sir? Yeah, I, I you signed up too? Yeah, general okay, that's right. That's right. We move you. Let's, let's take you up, sir. You could go up first, sir. Go, go, ahead. go right ahead. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, council members, um, this talk of affordable housing, uh, part of the problem is when Mr. Garcetti was in council, a councilman, I think they lost about 30,000 affordable housing units in the, con in the context of his development during the course of his district. There is right now a need for a motion. I talked to Mr. Weezar's people about it. I've talked to Mr. Price's people about it. Uh, I've got another copy of the motion I want to basically give to you. What I would like Mr. Weezar to do, or a member of this committee to do, would be to introduce a motion that I have here, and I'll give it out again, to basically treat tenants in demolition situations the same as tenants in um, in, uh, conver in uh, conversion situations. Basically, when, it, when a building's being converted, there's a tenant relocation plan that has to be provided as part of the package. That relocation plan is submitted, and it's incorporated into the, uh, into the entitlement. I want the same thing for demolitions, and I would appreciate if, in fact, we could move forward on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Doug Haynes. Welcome, sir. Hi. Uh, before I begin, my time starts. Um, I did give to the sergeant at arms. Yes, there's everyone. In, Go right here. You know, I waited two and a half hours, so if I can go over my one minute a little bit, it would be helpful. Sure. My name is Doug Haynes. Uh, I have an appeal pending before this body, and yet last week the developer began construction. Ooh. And what we found out is permits were issued by LADBS because the planning department gave clearances for those permits. And what we found out further is that the planning department has a policy that if you file a CEQA appeal, which we had to do in order to exhaust our administrative remedies, then they don't withhold permits. They allow it to happen, which means essentially the appeal process is futile. And <laughs> it's a mockery of our due process. So I have an appeal pending, and yet 
construction is going forward, a foundation is being poured this week, um, when does the appeal begin and when does the appeal end if construction is proceeding? What is the administrative record? I've asked that those appeal, that the permits be revoked repeatedly. I spoke before the City Planning Commission. We've sent a letter to the City Attorney. This is not a fair process. Yeah. Whose district is this? This is um, District 13. No fair. And we've okay. approached our council member. Again, this is before you. We're waiting for the appeal to be heard. Can you, uh, if you don't mind, if you could bring that to the attention of my planning director, Sean Cook, uh, tomorrow Absolutely. or day after, uh, because as a policy, if something needs to be fixed, we, we would certainly look into that. Um, that should not be happening unless the building and safety has an explanation, uh, a valid explanation. But it, Their it explanation is that planning on, gave clearance. Yeah, on its face, it doesn't seem appropriate that building and safety would allow excavation when an appeal is still pending. So we. If you get the address and we'll ask the questions for you to the departments and get some clarification. Thank you, okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. No more items on the agenda. This meeting is concluded, ended, finished, concluded.